so we have uh, a weekend to look at this wonderful text that was uh, written by Sia Lama to promote the long life of his teacher. Now, uh, many of you will know that I had a diagnosis of cancer and I'll get the main treatment in the summer. But I need to remind you that uh, with your interest in Dharma, you also have joined the Not Dead Yet Society. Every day we are reflecting on impermanence and death. And so the fact that our body will not live forever, it should not be a surprise. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this text explains um, many different Dharma views using the symbolism of the butter lamp. And it's a tantric text. That is to say, it's concerned with how we transform ourselves into the mandala of the Buddha. But of course, we begin with uh, refuge and uh, bodhicitta practice and the accumulation of merit. There is no contradiction between any of the Buddha's teachings. They all flow in the same direction. Very often people want simply the highest view. And some people say, oh, for Sokshen, there is no preparation necessary. You just go immediately into a, a recognition of your own true nature. But we have many karmic tendencies. The watchword in uh, Sokshen practice to, um, is to observe yourself. See how you function, see how you get lost in identification with thoughts, feelings, memories, and so on. If you don't know that you get lost, then you won't be able to allow the self-liberating of the point of lostness. So there is this uh, story uh, that comes uh, taught to me by Sialama from, it comes from Garab Dorji. There was a rich man who had much land, very big estates. <clears throat> and he had a son who he loved very much. But the son wanted to go to the town to find out about life. So he asked his father for his inheritance, and loaded up a bag of gold and set off for the city. He spent the gold, he had parties, entertained people, became very popular. But after some time, the gold was spent. The friends drifted away. And he was alone. Lost, hungry, uncertain how to live. So he thought, oh, maybe I have to go home. So he set off walking in a slow, dejected way in the direction of the estate. The father was out riding with his manager, looking at his property, and he saw in the distance this poor, bedraggled beggar approaching. Now, although the father immediately recognized his son, he said to his manager, oh, See that beggar in the distance, take him to the far end of my estate and put him in that fallen down little shack. Keep him there and uh, give him a little food. And when you go the next day, tell him if he wants more food, he has to do some work. He has to start to rebuild the house. This spoiled young man knew nothing about building. He put the walls up, but they fell down because he didn't know how to place the stones. But after some months, the walls were up and some kind of roof was on top. So the landowner said to his uh, manager, now uh, let him look after some sheep on the far hill. And he did this for months, and then he was promoted to looking after the cows and uh, keeping them safe and so on. 
after a year, this young man had become competent. He had a sense of self-respect and dignity. And then the landowner said, now bring him to the forest near the house. And the father went to meet him in the forest. And he said, oh, my son, you look so well, so strong. Welcome home and took him into the big house. So this is our situation. If we are doubtful about ourselves, if we are full of uh, confusions, regrets, guilt, self-hatred, it's impossible to really see what it means to have Buddha nature. This is the function of the preparatory practices that we let go of negative views of ourself and develop an ease of connectivity with everything around us. And so the accumulation of merit, of uh, virtue, provides us with a sense of our own competence, our warm-hearted connection with other people. And with the accumulation of wisdom, we start to understand dependent origination and then emptiness. And we start to see how the open space of the mind becomes obscured by uh, reification and grasping. So if we're going to recite the, uh, the Batalan prayer, we begin with the uh, initial uh, request to, to Padma Sambhava. Those of you who do the uh, small Padma Sambhava meditation practice will be familiar with this. So I just uh, read through the, the, the Tibetan of this first part. So we evoke the presence of Padmasambhava to have his support as we engage in the practice. As we have looked many times, uh, it, it's not helpful to do the practice as a solitary self. I have, if we're believing, I have to find my way, it's all up to me. I have to really uh, push very hard. This is uh, unsustainable over the years. So then we evoke Padmasambhava by reciting the seven line prayer three times. The first time invites him to be in front of us. Then we pray to him with the second recitation and with the third, we receive his blessing. And then we recite the refuge and bodhicitta in this and all my future lives until I gain enlightenment, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. This is uh, our statement, I need help. When you watch children go growing up, you see how they push for more and more autonomy. It's as teenagers, they think, oh, it's my life. If you're the parents, you might think, oh, oh, but you got your life from me. But that's irrelevant for the teenager. I can find my own way. And we live in a culture now that increasingly lets children learn from their own painful mistakes. We call this freedom. More traditional societies might call it abandonment. But the point for us is that we never find our own way. We are dependent on others always. For food, for clothing, for having a computer. There are so many things that are rest on the intelligence and goodwill of other people. 
I am not an isolated ego self. I am a participant in the world. I am part of this. And so in relation to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, we rely on the uh, compassion and kindness of the Buddha to have taught and we follow the teaching. We study uh, and practice this teaching, which is called the Dharma. And we do it in the company of others. On an outer level, we now have in our small Sangha some practice groups that meet online, and that's a very sweet form of support. But we also have to make our uh, Dharma understanding dynamic. It, it's not a vague hope that we will get refuge from Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. It's not like if we are sinking in the sea and we put up our hand, we are hoping, hoping that someone will see it. When we pray to Padmasambhava, of course he sees and hears us. Padmasambhava is awareness. Awareness has no beginning or end. No inside or outside. It is in contact with everything which is occurring. So we are becoming more awakened to the responsive, interactive nature of our being in the world. So we can study dependent arising or dependent origination. On the basis of this, that arises. If we make a gesture, there will be a responding gesture and that meets as a connectivity. The more we practice, we more, the more we see that this is the case. Although the blessing of all the Buddhas is always present and with us, we have to activate it in relation to ourselves. It's not something that they give to us. It is a co-emergent, direct uh, presencing. And then we go on to say, uh, on the basis of my generosity and the other virtues which I accumulate, I will, in this and all my future lives, work for the benefit of all beings. So, even when we are just beginning on the Bodhisattva path, we're saying, I will not forget all beings. The clarity of the wisdom eye of the Buddha means that they see everything immediately until that is uh, awakened in us, we have to rely on an intentional reflection on the situation of all beings in samsara. But the principle is the same. And the root of this is very profound. This is the heart of Dzogchen, which means the great completion, the great inclusion. Nothing is outside of this. Duality, the notion of self as being fundamentally separate from other, is a delusion. Ignorance of the ground, of the intrinsic completeness, is itself the basis for separation and isolation. The more we uh, are convinced that we have a separate existence and we're not like other people, the more we uh, protect the garden of ourselves and plant the kind of flowers we want and remove the kind of weeds that we don't want. And of course, the more we particularize our own particular profile, we find that there are fewer and fewer people in the world that we really connect with. So then we end up liking some people a lot, not so many maybe, and not liking some people, not very much. But most people, most dogs, most cats, most birds, and so on, we don't really care. Good luck, but nothing to do with me. This, from the Buddhist point of view, this is a kind of mental dullness. 
the bird in the sky, the fish in the sea, the snail wandering on the rocks. These have all been your mother in a previous life. We are always already connected. Connectivity is intrinsic. Disconnection, isolation, rejection, separation, these are all the activities of the mind under the dark power of duality. This is very, very profound. We don't offer goodwill to others because we are nice people. We offer goodwill because we are all in this together. In terms of our obscurations and uh, karmic burden, we are all in samsara together. If we gain empowerment, then with those Vajra brothers and sisters that we gain the empowerment with, we are in the same mandala together. And in relation to Dzogchen, the soul ground, the undivided ground, the unlimited ground is the ground of everything. So <clears throat> we are always connected. <clears throat> when you don't feel connected, then immediately liking some, not liking others will arise. This is why the practice of the Guru Yoga of the White Eye is so helpful because it immediately opens us to the ground, which being without limits includes everyone immediately. Then we see that it is our own concepts, our own identifications and definitions, which chop the world up into pieces. Just as in terms of the planet, there are surface variations, mountains and lakes and so on. But these are aspects of the planet. What human beings bring is national boundaries and identities and barbed wire and passports. These differentiations are powerful and they can be very restrictive to people's freedom. Yet they are conventional. They are not resting on some intrinsic truth but they vary according to the expansion and contraction of national boundaries. When we see how that operates externally, we can see that we bring the same deluded attitude to ourselves. I am me. This is my body. My territory. But then I'm a little bit puzzled. How come there is cancer living in my territory, in my body? This is outrageous. I want to say, Rouse, get out, go away. You don't belong here. Illegal immigrant. But whose body is it? This flesh and blood body is the body of karma, of dependent arising from the point of view of uh, Tantra, it is an illusory form. It has no inner essence. It uh, manifests through the functioning of the various aspects of liver and heart and lungs and so on. So connectivity is basic. Isolation, separation is false, a deluded understanding. Then we have <clears throat> the seven branch practice, which comes from a very famous uh, aspiration that was made by the Bodhisattva Samantabhadra. Uh, Samantabhadra as Bodhisattva is, is not the same as the primordial Buddha Samantabhadra. He is one of the eight great uh, Samantabhadras and uh, he's not so much uh, practiced in India, but in China is very popular. 
in a way, I will read through the Tibetan to give you the connection. Baba Jambo Shanu Jibala Chan Salo Jinin Sudha Chuchu Jitena Dusun Shabemi Isengekun Dagye Malo Deda Tanshela Ludanga Ye Dangwe Chal Giyo Zambo Chupi Manlan Tudagi Jabwe Tanshi Yiki Monsundu Shinge Duche Lura Tupaye Java Kunla Rabdu Chasalo Duche Tena Dunye Sanjena, Sanje seye wana jubada, de tara chugi yina malupa, tanche jawe dagi gangwa mo, de da naba mise, jamso na yangye yin la jamso drakungi, jawa kungi yin de razoji, de warishimbe tanche dagi to meto dampa, jama dambada, sinyen yanda juba dubchurda. Marme chudam de burdam baye, Javan de dalani chuparangi. Daza damba nandan richurda. Chima burmarira nyambada. Guba keeper baba chukungi, Javan de dalani chuparangi, chabagana. Lamen jachewa de da jave tanche layamo. Tambo chuli la. De peto dangi, Java kun la chasa chipurgi. Ducha shedan timo wongini ludanga. Nadan de shi yiki kya. De ba dagi ge ba chichi. Pa de da tanche dagi so so sha. Ducha java kun e da sanje se. Rangya nanda ludami luda. Rawa kungi sunangalayan deda kungi jesu dagi yara Ganan chuchu jiden dranaki chanchi rimbara sanji machani Gumbo deda dagi tanchela kolo lana me parakolwako Nandatong ganshi deda la drawa kunla penshin devorach Kalba jinge duche shubaya dagi talmo rabja sulwaye Chasa wada chushin shabada jisu iran kishin sulwaye Kewa chunze dagi jisamba tanche dagi chanchu chungu Jamba pavo jitar kembada kundo zambo deyan de shinte Deda kingi jesu da lo chi ge wa de da tam chi rab tu ngo. So you can read the text through. It's very uh, open, very clear. A summary, a summary of it is given in the penultimate verse. The penultimate, the second last one. And that verse you also find in the short Padmasambhava practice. That verse contains uh, the, the whole of the, the seven branches of the practice. And this became a, a very uh, popular way of accumulating merit. So we pay salutation and we make offerings and we also make our confession to separate us from our negative tendencies. We rejoice at the merit of others. How wonderful that good deeds and kindness is enacted by many creatures in all the different realms. We ask the Buddhas to uh, turn the wheel of Dharma to teach and we request them not to vanish, not to pass, pass into enlightenment. So these are the first six branches. Then you say, whatever small amount of virtue I have collected, I dedicate it for the enlightenment of all. This uh, dedication of merit is very important. Everything I do, I do for all. I hold in mind all the beings in the six realms. I hold in mind with kindness the victims of war and also the perpetrators of war. May they all gain enlightenment. 
our wish for the enlightenment of all beings is not based on some evaluation of whether they are entitled to it or not. So there is some kind of paradox here. In order to accumulate merit, I'm going to be very careful to only practice virtue, kindness, helping, and so on. And I'm going to avoid anything harmful or exploitative or cruel towards other people. And yet, having very carefully accumulated this mountain of merit, I take handfuls of it and throw it out into the world. This is for everyone, however you are. All are entitled. And the key thing here, when we do this kind of practice, is we are imagining, we are sending good wishes, we are engaged in an activity of connectivity. So this is this is the path, is to see that although the uh, separation of subject and object is an illusion. Still, in the manner of a dream, I will accumulate merit and the wisdom of understanding emptiness in order to benefit all beings. So, last year we looked a bit at the production of these small clay figures of Padmasambhava and also of the wealth vases to plant in the earth. This work is still being carried on by a few people, but very few. So I would encourage you, if you have any interest in this, please uh, use this uh, good path of virtue. Uh, as with many lamas, uh, Siya Lama had uh, many different teachers, but uh, his uh, main teacher, his root guru was uh, Tukutsolo. We have a text of Tukutsolos translated in the book, Finding Freedom. After Sialama left uh, Tibet, he came to India. Uh, he had already married uh, Roma, uh, a Sikhamese woman. And they went to uh, Tsopema, in uh, Himachal Pradesh in North India, a famous uh, pilgrimage place for Padmasambhava. And uh, it was there, Rinpoche did a three year retreat. Uh, and during that, he wrote this prayer uh, for the long life of his teacher who was still in Tibet. And having in Tibet, of course, he had to go through all the difficulties of the Chinese invasion. While uh, doing this uh, retreat, um, Siya Lama was uh, himself. He was very, very uh, friendly and social. When I was with him in India, he would often stop people in the street and ask them who they were and what they were doing. And he was very, very connective. When I lived in... Uh, Rupachi's house in uh, Bengal. Almost every day his uh, wife would come out to see me. I had a little room at the back of the house on the outside. And she would complain to me about Rupachi's many faults. One of her favorite complaints was that when they had got married in Sikkim, he had given money to buy her very nice jewelry, bangles, and so on. But when they were in this retreat in Tsopema, he would keep asking her, oh, perhaps we could sell that bangle because so many people come to the house and we need to give them tea and biscuits and we should always be generous. Now, the invitation to be generous might be a deep teaching, but it also can wound the heart. So life between men and women is often not easy. Anyway, this is what he wrote. So I will read the Tibetan of the first part, which, and then I'll explain it. And this sets the scene. 
Prani Daki Marmo Dito Sin Deye Tule Chupe Kandro Ma Kasa Shinze Chinsu Nangasi Chanti Tukar Tamo Chagwe Nga Yishin Nurbu Gudu Kunjun Le Rengu Waza Pame Ratu Se Chupe Lamo Drame Dran Le De Ramse Gine Samo Rere Ye Chantu China Samwe Drame Umbo tsene taye chare ta, magyo tsene jansu chumbo nyan, dumbo tsene rikya lumbo ta, meche zene sisa bandu kya, wuni liya nime dungchir bumle la. Nube china mumba kunsa ne drukun drukwe, tsense rab sengyo namo ratna chaya ya namo bhagavati benza sara pramadani tata gata ya arhate samya sambhuta ya tariyata oi benze benze maha benze maha teja benze maha vidya benze maha bodhi chita benze maha bodhi manota uba samkrana Benze sarwa karma awarani bishudani benzas ye soha oen benza dhammaranita praranita sampraranita sarwa buddha ketra kratsali ti prajnaparamita nada swa bave benza dharma hridaya Santo Shani Hunga Hunga Hung Ho 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 Akam Soha. So this few pages set out the visualization that we want to maintain while we are uh, offering the butter lamps. So the first line says, my awareness is the red dakini holding a curved knife and a skull cup. So she is uh, dancing. So she has her right hand up uh, holding this uh, knife and her left hand has a skull cup uh, near her, just below her heart. So this is a practice in the style of Anu Yoga, which means that we don't build up the visualization. It's more the feeling tone. This is who I am in an instant. So in our ordinary body, wearing our ordinary clothes we are members of our society and uh, this mode of embodiment links us into many assumptions and projections about identity and the purpose of life and so on this is described as uh, the, the domain of impure relative truth it's relative because the dimension of self and other of uh, duality is functioning and it is impure because the five afflicting poisons are in operation through our being in the world this is our mental opacity the way in which we don't see clearly in place of clarity we imagine and assume if we don't like someone because of some interaction of their perceived shape and our perceived shape, then we take them to be our enemy. I don't like them. So not only do I uh, impute to them, I imagine within them a, a real separate existence, but I I'm sure that I know the truth about their existence, that it's bad and I don't like them and I don't want them near me. So with this reification and objectification, uh, the forces of desire, aversion, pride and jealousy quickly swirl around. So when in an instant we become this red dakini, our karmic identity is left behind and we are in this pure form. So we are in pure relative truth where there is still 
the sense of duality, but there are no hooks for the five poisons. So it's as if you are a, a battered woman in a bad relationship. You've done your best, but the, you've had enough of this karmic husband. So you're leaving for a woman's refuge. So this is the pure form of the red dakini. It's a very quick divorce. Then, not only do you have this visualization, but it continues from your own heart, emanates a radiant white dakini, whose very beautiful face and three eyes which are looking at the sky. So in looking at the sky, this is highlighting the emptiness which is the basis and field of all appearances. She is an aspect of the activity of the red dakini. She's not somebody else. It's like if you go to the sea, uh, particularly maybe the Atlantic coast or some big sea, you see the water, the ocean, the big waves are rolling in and rolling in. And across the surface of the big wave, there are little ripples moving. So the red dakini is like a big wave and the white dakini is like a little ripple. And from her, more and more little ripples are moving, energy moving out in different forms. So uh, she has her hands together at her heart. As we know, in India, this is a gesture of salutation. It also completes the circle as the left hand and the right hand join together. And within this uh, with gesture of her hands together, there is a wish-fulfilling jewel. It's called the source of all satisfaction. It gives you whatever you want. This it represents the mind. We imagine everything we ever encounter, we imagine. The six realms of samsara are not uh, geographical places, they are imaginings. Some aspects of our perception and interpretation are uh, conditioned by our karma so that we have general agreements that uh, if we are in the city we shouldn't just walk across the road because cars can hit us so this is very important to see on a general level uh, we have the sense the world is full of things their thingness is established but we human beings have different uh, attitudes to these things. Some people like them, some people don't like them, but anyway, they are there. But this view would be called the impure relative truth. In the pure relative truth, everything is the movement of the mind. There are no self-existing phenomena. The name seems to point to something definite but the most definitive aspect of anything is its name phenomena are always interactive and changing when we understand this we see that participation warms the world and makes it soft and pliable a bit as if you had uh, some candle wax and uh, you wanted to do shape it you can hold it in your hand and the warmth of your hand will soften the wax and then you can mold it but the the cold rigidity of the ego state is like ice it's uh, unmalleable but when you get close when you offer yourself into participation everything softens and becomes more workable so from this jewel, 
innumerable rays of light spread out, each of them manifesting a countless, uh, an offering goddess. Some offering goddesses are offering food, some are offering music, some are offering dance, they offer whatever is uh, pleasing to the senses. In particular, uh, many of these goddesses, they are all dressed with beautiful ornaments. And in particular, we focus on them holding uh, outer, inner and secret lamps in their hands. The, the pot of each of these lamps is huge. It's like the chain of iron mountains that uh, surrounds our world within the center of which is Mount Meru. And the amount of oil they have in them is like a great ocean. The outer lamps means the lamps you can see where you, where you burn something and the flame gives light. The inner lamp is the lamp of insight that allows you to see the empty nature of all phenomena. And the secret lamp is the uh, luminosity of uh, Rigpa, of awareness. In the middle of each of these pots, uh, the wick is the size of Mount Meru, means very, very big. And the flames spread out with a light brighter than a million, million suns. And by this power, all darkness, outer and inner, is cleared. And thus the fuel of samsara, that is to say the karma moving in the minds of all beings is burnt up till it's exhausted. How can this be the case? I live in London, there are many people here, millions of people. How can I burn up their karma? This kind of thought and worry arises because we start in the wrong place. We are assuming that these people exist. All the Dharma teachings from the five skandhas, the five uh, heaps of constituents onwards, all are saying there is no inherent existence in people, in sentient beings. We are all patterns of manifestation. The energy of the ground manifests color, shape, sounds in the manner of a dream. We already looked at connectivity is intrinsic, separation and isolation is uh, contrived, is artificial, deluded. So in Tantra, we use uh, symbols. The symbol is a way of uh, easing us out of the harshly definitive uh, function of dualistic conceptualization. So this whole sequence, being the red dakini, the white dakini coming out, rays of light, many offering goddesses, endless light coming, all beings karma burnt up. This is a whole wave of imagination like a symphony and just as with the music you have to give yourself to the music open yourself to the music and then it's uh, many textures and rhythms and so on will carry you so with this imaginal production you are carried but it's it's not an entertainment it's not taking us away from our ordinary life, which we then have to come back to. It is an imagination which dissolves the nightmare of the real. There is nothing real. Form and emptiness, sound and emptiness, thoughts and emptiness. Imagination. Imagination is not me imagining something. I am the imagined. Who is the imaginer? No one. The dualistic delusion of samsara is to privilege the idea of the real over the actuality of the imagined. So this is something you have to 
examined for yourself. What self-existing, truly autonomous things can you find in the world? It's interpretation. We have to look again and again until this becomes clear. Otherwise, the practice of Tantra is not really going to help us. Everything is imagined. Houses, planets, motor cars, people. There is not one thing which has its own personal essence or inherent existence. This is the basis for the functioning of tantric practice. So then uh, we have uh, this long uh, dharani, which is a kind of long mantra, which is a activating function. So it evokes the three jewels, offers salutations to the Vajra essence of emptiness. Everything is the great gift of emptiness. And this is the, true also for all the Tathagata, the Buddhas, the Arhats, the complete Buddhas. They are not separate from emptiness. So then saying, oh, this Vajra, Vajra, great shining Vajra. Vajra means the indestructibility of emptiness. The forms of emptiness, the appearances of emptiness, they are like reflections in the mirror. Emptiness is like the mirror itself. Awareness and emptiness, kindness and emptiness. This is the great Vajra. This is the meaning of the great enlightenment. Our activity in the world, whatever we do, is like a stream of Vajras. It's formations of the energy of emptiness. When you see this, then you see that your experience becomes very pure and strong because everything you experience is inseparable from the unborn ground. This uh, indestructible jewel of Dharma brings us long life. That is to say, when awareness is settled in emptiness, it never ends. There is no death. This is the fulfillment of life. That is to say, uh, it's long life in the sense of the Amitayus, the, the Buddha of long life. It means uninterrupted access to emptiness and uninterrupted showing of many different forms. This knowledge is the transcendent wisdom. And without effort, naturally arising from this is the sound which is the, uh, the essence of emptiness. So this sound is like the pulsation, just as sound vibrates, so light is also vibrating. This is like these offering goddesses coming out with their lights and the pulsation of their energy connects with all beings and dissolves their karma. So this ungraspable connective energy satisfies all beings because it returns them to their own ground and it never ceases manifesting from the sky. Okay, so now we finish the introductory part and we take a break and then come back and start into the main text. If we can be back in 25 minutes, at five minutes too. Great. See you then. Talking to myself. <coughs> so, um, the butter lamp is just a, a small pot, comes in different shapes and sizes. In the bowl itself, in the middle, there's a small hole and you insert a piece of uh, usually bamboo with some cotton wool around it. So uh, this is the basic uh, symbolism that's been going to be used as a support for explaining different Dharma views. There are many different uh, butter lamp prayers or butter 
lamp aspirations in uh, Tibetan. So you come to uh, get a sense of it. <clears throat> So the the first verse is Chuyinkuna Sajindu Lama Sanjiriki Latsola Pulo Jene Chutungu Jutso. So we're imagining that the pot is the all pervading hospitable space. This is the Dharma Datu. Datu means space. In Dharma, in this uh, context, means uh, phenomena, whatever can appear outside or inside. So the Dharma Datu is, a, is another way of talking about emptiness. It's a way of uh, pointing to the non-duality of all appearance and emptiness. So if you think of the sun and the moon and the stars and all the things we know on this planet and the people and all the insects and the six realms of samsara and the traditional geography of uh, the world with Mount Meru in the middle, which the Tibetans uh, gained from India, all appearances and experiences of any of these forms is inseparable from the Dharma Datu, the ground emptiness. So inside this pot, uh, the butter, the clarified butter, the ghee, uh, is swirling and it is the absolute truth uh, bodhicitta. So again, there's a term donda means emptiness. In the Changchub Sem means uh, the, the mind of enlightenment, bodhicitta, which means uh, rigpa. You can, through the different texts, you can identify subtle differences between these terms, but it's important for us, who perhaps don't have so much time to study in great detail, to see that the central point is repeated again and again. So it's saying within this container of hospitable emptiness, the oil of uh, the inseparability of awareness and emptiness is moving. Inserted in this is the wick of the uh, samadhi or uh, mental calmness, profound mental calmness. Uh, undisturbed by thoughts. It doesn't mean that no thoughts or memories are arising, but they don't impinge, they don't get to awareness because awareness is not like the ego self. Our ego consciousness is reactive. Something occurs and our sense is it's happening to me and so we react to that. Awareness is free of the sense of self and other. It's when you're sitting and you're relaxed, experiences arise. Some could be described as on the side of the self and some could be described on the side of the other, but this is not the non-dual experience of awareness. If you completely blocked experience, then you would be like a stone. Rather, the mind is open and experiences, as it we describe on the subject side, I experience this, or appearances, as we would say on the object side, look at that over there. These are both self-arising and self-liberating or self-banishing. So, for example, you're sitting and there's a sound, a thought comes, oh, it's a dog. 
the sound is already vanishing. The thought, it's a dog, is already vanishing. So when the mind is inseparable from the Dharma Dhatu, there's no reactivity. Then perhaps there's some sensation in your back. It's there and then it's gone. If you don't grasp it, if you don't elaborate it, it's self-vanishing. So sitting in this undisturbed openness, what could be called outside or could be called inside, because they are self-liberating, show their non-existence. So this is the meaning here of free of dualistic thought. And it says the flame of this um, self-occurring or self-existing clarity of awareness burns brightly. This uh, term uh, self-occurring, it means not made by anyone else. Neither awareness is made by anything, by causes and circumstances, nor the clarity which it provides through its illuminating power, uh, no, neither does it have any causes or conditions. So the flame that burns from this is uh, the first of the five uh, wisdoms or five original knowings. It's the uh, primordial clarity or a primordial um, knowing or perspicacity, which is um, the purification of mental dullness. So this uh, illumination of the empty ground of all phenomena shows that whatever arises vanishes by itself. So this takes us to the next line, the thoughts arising from the affliction of stupidity are liberated in their own place. The aff affliction means this is something which limits us or poisons us. And uh, in this case, it's the stupidity or mental dullness or assumption, which is the basic condition of uh, mental functioning in samsara. They are liberated in their own place. So oh, if we go back to the example, you hear a dog barking. A series of thoughts could arise from that. It's the neighbor's dog. They've gone away again. They leave the dog. No wonder it's barking. So in that way, one thought leads to another. But if you stay simply with the arising, you hear the bark. And maybe the first thought, it's a dog. And it's gone. So maybe you remember the instruction that we get in many, many books. It says, <clears throat> don't go after past thoughts. The thought has already gone. But something more can be done with it. Whose desire is this? This is ego consciousness. Ego consciousness is like a kind of malign doppelganger. You might know the story of uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In the daytime, uh, Dr. Jekyll is curing people and very helpful surgeon. And at nighttime, his uh, altered ego, his other self, goes out murdering. So this is our situation. When we're new to the practice, we have some moments of being relaxed and open. But then we get involved. I need this. Now, his, the text is saying very clearly, the mind is not different from the Dharma Dhatu. It's like the sky. It has no substance. It has no pockets. It has no stomach. It doesn't need any of these things. But when we lose touch with the open ground. 
we don't see directly the vanishing of the thought, it's gone. But maybe there's something I could do. The relationship's over. The beloved has left. But your hand keeps going out to the phone. Should I ring? Maybe not. Should I ring? I want to ring. No, I mustn't ring. So it is this kind of, there is something there to get. This is what stupidity means here. It, it's not the stupidity of not knowing anything at all. It's the stupidity of replacing simple clarity with conceptual elaboration. But it was so important. Hmm. This is because I think the object has the answer. But I am giving the meaning to the object. And having projected this meaning into the object, I now take it that meaningfulness is inherent in the object. This is like being a teenager and starting to follow some music band. You go to the concert, you get the t-shirt. Your parents say, this is not music, this is just crap noise. Yeah, old people, they never understand. I know the truth. They are the best. So it's just like this. The band plays some kind of music. You can like or not like. If you like, you like. This is a subjective feeling. But the reason I like them is because they're amazing. They're the best. Oh, what you've done is you've abandoned yourself, your own feeling tone, and projected it into the object. Now, of course, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you believe that the band is the best, you have a very good reason to like them. This gives you a kind of confidence. It's maybe a little bit more difficult to say, I don't know, I just like them. You, you don't have to like them, but I like them. How can I justify the fact I like them? The ego's anxiety wants to have a confirmation of the validity of its own interpretation. So this is what we looked at earlier, impure relative truth. You have the duality of self and other, but now from your own mind, you are investing the other with a particular value and are mistakenly identifying it as being inherent in the object. Uh, this projected value <clears throat> could be negative. These are my enemies, they have to be destroyed. It could be pride, idealization, desire, <clears throat> jealousy, that person's trying to destroy my relationship. She keeps looking at my partner. So these, uh, from this root, from ignorance, comes this mental uh, obscurity or darkness or not seeing. And from that, the other four poisons, desire, aversion, jealousy, and pride, just bounce out very easily. So he's saying that... <clears throat> If your mind is relaxed, <clears throat> thoughts arising from this uh, opacity, this mental thickening, just will go free by themselves. So then the next line he says, <clears throat> without rejecting them, without discarding them, these thoughts um, melt into the vastness of the givenness of the actuality of all phenomena. These uh, verses that we're going to experience, they're full of Dharma technical terms, <clears throat> which makes them a little bit indigestible, but also useful for trying to understand what these 
terms you find everywhere actually mean. So, <clears throat> the, the Dharma Datu, the, the space of all dharmas, another aspect of it is called Dharmata or Chunyi. Chunyi points to the truth of phenomena. They are actually appearance and emptiness. When I'm <clears throat> in my teenage bedroom idealizing the band, I know that they are great. Their emptiness is invisible to me. They are really good, truly good. That's the truth. If you can't see that, you're stupid. In that moment, <clears throat> because we are grasping onto a, a construct as if it were something intrinsic, it is we ourselves who are becoming stupid. So it's <clears throat> always, <clears throat> always useful to go back and read the Heart Sutra. Because it explains very well, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is not other than emptiness, emptiness also is not other than form. This band that I love is emptiness. Emptiness is not other than this band. If I hear the emptiness of their music, if I see the emptiness of the movements they make when they're on stage, then it's like rainbows in the sky. But this is, this soup is too thin for the ego. The ego wants the definite truth. They are the best. And so it's oh, the, the distortion, the twisting of our potential, of our mental energy goes into a privileging of a selected object, which leads us to further blindness in ourselves. So this is, uh, this is something you can uh, take close to your own heart. <laughs> What is special for you? Is it special for other people? That's just your choice. So if you say to the beloved, I love you. I know that many people don't like you. I know that many people see you just as a formation of faults. But I love you. This is not generally considered romantic. You have to say, oh, you are the best. You are so beautiful. So you can see in your own life how the, <clears throat> the topology, the peaks and valleys of your experience relate to your own karmic patterning, but you identify them as objectively valid. There's nothing wrong with liking something. If you see that the something you like is a transient, <clears throat> illusory phenomenon, everything changes. If we see the impermanence of phenomena, then the hubris of grand statements of eternal love might die in our throats due to causes and conditions. I find you attractive. Again, not very romantic. The ego is saying, I am a lie. I don't really exist, but I want to exist. And if you loved me, you would pretend that I exist. So now we can make a devil's contract together. I believe you exist, you're real, and you're special. And you believe that I exist, and I'm real, and I'm special. I'm so lucky to have met you. So we have to observe this. 
if this person was truly special, everyone would be wanting to appreciate them. And why this is important is because the variety of phenomena, the variety of uh, the shapings of illusory appearance, are, this, this variety has no limit to it. But if you make something special, you dislocate it from where it is as part of the field. And this is what the texts mean by what we call here mental dullness or stupidity. When, <clears throat> when we observe sitting in our practice, when we observe thoughts and feelings arise and pass, we see that they, they come and go. The texts say, Rangsar draw, they dissolve or liberate or vanish in their own place. Always. This is what, this is how it is. There's no past, there's no future, there's just here and now, only this. So, it's as if you're standing vertically, you, the power of gravity is flowing through you, and you're completely settled with your muscles relaxed, the skeleton doing its work. And then you lean forward as if you're wanting something. And then you're off balance. And you have to move, you have to do something. Again, you try and lean backwards. You feel you're going to fall over. You have to do something. You should try this again and again with your body until it's very clear. When I am dislocated, when I am decentered, I am off balance, which leads to must do something. This is why samsara is moving. So that's what he's been describing, that all the thoughts, even the most stupid, confusing, deceitful thoughts, all of them are self-liberating in their own place. When you don't interfere, when you allow the free flow of this and this and this and this, then we go on to the next line. Then the clarity or wisdom or original knowing of this uh, open space of possibility, the Dharma Datu, manifests as shining rays of light. That is to say, when you see that everything you experience is inseparable from emptiness it's like a dream then why would you have any bias or prejudice you go to the cinema light is projected on a screen simply light the light is patterned there is sound coming out of the speakers you have paid money and you are receiving the vibrations of light and sound. But again, you, you know that the food in the cinema is very thin soup. You brought your own sandwiches. Your thoughts, your feelings, your imaginings. You put this into the drama. This character is wonderful. This character is horrible. I wouldn't like to meet that person. They, they, they are Im imagined. They don't exist. These are actors. They get paid to do this. Anyway, I wouldn't like to meet them. They're scary. The, that's your homemade sandwich. The light of the world is bright and shining. You're not eating the fresh food of immediate experience. You're eating what you've prepared earlier, your own karmic snack. When you're doing that, this radiant light is not shining for you. You are seeing the things you imagined. You are not seeing the light that is revealed. 
So then he says, in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru and the gods of the Buddha clan. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So uh, this verse is dealing with um, ignorance and mental darkness and stupidity. Its purification is the Dharma Dhatu. This is the realm of the Buddhas. So in terms of the five Buddha families, this is the family which is dealing with the purification of stupidity into the clarity of the Buddha mind or the, the seeing the that everything is an aspect of the Dharma Dhatu. And this is the quality of the Buddha family. So he's been describing how you can understand uh, the pure ground and the manner in which it gets uh, obscured. But he's saying, don't keep this just as a kind of personal insight. We are concerned to dispel the darkness of all sentient beings in all the realms. And so we offer it to the Guru and all the deities belonging to this uh, Buddha family. Please accept this and, and bestow on us this uh, attainment of clarity. So just as we began with the uh, the red dakini and then the white dakini and then all these offering goddesses, offering light, offering light. We also are offering. So although there has never actually been any tear in the hole, there is no ignorance, there is no wound. As long as we are under the power, of duality, we will be uh, suffering the primordial wound and creating more small wounds. So if you <clears throat> if you get a, a big cut, you have to go to the hospital and the doctor will stitch the sides of the wound together, join the skin, and that will help the wound to heal. We offer up to the Buddha, the light comes down to us and we offer it to all sentient beings. This is like the needle and thread of the surgeon. We are joining subject and object, joining subject and object. Then we go into the next verse and he says, uh, oh, I should read the Tibetan. So he says, wonderful, which each verse begins with wonderful, meaning this is what he's about to say is, wow, this is the truth. If you see this truth, it will transform your life. So this time, the, the pot, the butter lamp pot is free of bias. It has no center or circumference. It's infinite and even in all directions. And within this, the oil which liberates attachment on the natural ground is moving. When uh, attachment to something is liberated on the ji, on the, the ground which, which is empty, which has no substance, then we see, oh, the value of the object was not inherent in the object. If you've been very involved with someone and <clears throat> then you break up, you might think, oh, I don't know what I saw in that person. They mean nothing to me. But they did mean something to me. 
have they really changed that much? It's my own feelings which have changed. So when we see attachment dissolving in the empty ground, you see that the wave arises, I want this, this is so important, and then it dissolves back in to the ocean and simply becomes a thought among thoughts, a feeling among fe feelings. On the wick of knowing one's own nature of happiness and clarity, and this uh, term, wrong mo, our own nature or our own face or the truth of how we are, is clarity and happiness. And this happiness is uh, like a kind of satisfaction or contentment. It's enough. So again, for, for, for our meditation, this is very helpful. When you've had enough to eat, unless you've developed some neurotic turn, the hunger vanishes. We also know that maybe if we're lonely or sad or angry or upset, we can eat to try to manage the emotion. So the clear communication between plate and eye and mouth and stomach is interrupted by the wave of emotion going through us. So this is similar to what he was saying in the previous verse, that if you get distracted, if you go after some thought or feeling, you are pulled out of balance. So as this uh, wick is inserted into the oil, a flame arises, the flame of the arising of the natural clarity of awareness. So this, is, this uh, line here is referring to the mirror-like wisdom. The mirror shows everything without bias. It's non-judgmental, open and available, neither turning towards what seems attractive or turning away from the unattractive. So you might say that the mirror itself, which of course is empty of its own formation, is content with whatever occurs it is our ego consciousness, our dualistic consciousness based on liking and not liking, which jumps into involvement. So in the first line, he's saying, this pot is free of bias. It's not leaning in any direction. So then the next line says, thoughts arising from the affliction of anger are liberated in their own place. So we follow the Dharma, we get the teachings, we sit and we get a little bit more familiar with how our mind is. Maybe we say to someone, I don't like you. Now, if we're not entirely intoxicated by the feeling, we have some space to hear what we're saying I don't like you. Now, we might have been looking for the mind. With the help of our five questions, does the mind have shape and color? Is it big or small? Does it come from someplace, remain someplace, go someplace? Oh, the mind is empty. It has no substance. <laughs> But I feel I exist, I am someone. But then the more we sit, we see, oh, what I call I, me, myself is a patterning of experience. So then we start to see, I don't like you. It's like a wave or it's like a wind blowing in the sky. The wind shifts the patterning of the clouds. If you say to someone, I don't like you, that also shifts something. It shifts the patterning of your relatedness. But have you rejected someone? 
do they have a real existence within duality? Subject and object are both taken to be real and separate. So if we get caught in that, <clears throat> we have to go back to the first verse where he's talking about the Dharma Dhatu. The Dharma, in the Dharma Dhatu, both what we call subject and what we call object are arising together as illusory forms. We have to remember illusory forms have impact on other illusory forms. Mm -hmm. If you go up in an airplane, you can pass through the clouds. But if rain starts to fall from the cloud, you get wet. If you see a rainbow, you get excited. The fact that things are illusory doesn't mean they don't have impact. It means they don't have inherent existence. They don't have any underpinning self-substance. So if you stay with this unbiased mind, free of friend and enemy, then we see this feeling of anger arises and vanishes. I hate you. Is this telling me about your qualities? Or is it telling me about a, the current patterning of the ingredients or potential of my ego construct? As we saw in the first verse with the image of the band, <clears throat> I make the band special. This is a subjective relationship disguised as my accessing an objective truth. So the same is here with anger. That I think that I am angry because of how you are. You are making me angry. So saying if you don't lean into the anger, if you stay grounded and open, the anger will arise and vanish by itself in its own place. You don't have to get rid of the, the angry thought. If you just leave it alone, it will dissolve. But if you think, I shouldn't be angry, this is a bad thought, I, I need to change. I need to do some purification. This might sound like an ethical Dharma thought, but inside the view that we're looking at here, it's actually an impediment to practice. Because when I say to myself, this is a bad thought, I am obscuring its intrinsic emptiness. This is very challenging for us. All phenomena are inseparable from emptiness. They are inherently pure. Now, that doesn't mean I can get angry with you and beat you up because it's all empty. That would be a, a crazy concept. If I see your emptiness, I haven't projected any substantial negativity into you. So, so why would I be going to attack you? This is so helpful to see emptiness is itself ethical. Just to say everything is empty, that's not ethical. But when you see directly, oh, it's vanished, it's gone. There's no urge to do anything with the situation. So don't keep emptiness as a concept, as an idea. Massage it into yourself till it is your mode of perception of the illusory phenomena. So then he says, original knowing as mirroring manifests as shining rays of light. So oh, this is the mirror-like wisdom which is the purification of anger. That is to say, 
this wisdom arises when you see the self-purifying or self-liberating nature of anger. You don't have to purify it. Then we have the three lines which are very similar to the three lines at the end of the first verse. In order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru and the gods of the Vajra clan. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. <clears throat> this time we're offering the light of the wisdom or original knowing, uh, which is like a mirror, the purification of anger to the Buddhas and Gurus and deities of the Vajra family. And again, we are saying, please accept this and bestow your blessing on us. Your, the blessing of the Gurus and Buddhas of this family is the illusory nature of anger, both its provocations and its movement. But the key thing is the first verse we looked at, if you really see everything is within the Dharma Dhatu, it is empty. You look at the ocean, you look at the waves. Some waves are very smooth, some have a bit more of a crest, some have frothy bubbles on the top. But it's all water. If you see that these are the forms of water, how could you say this water, this wave is better than that? In the same way, if you see the empty truth of all phenomena, how can we say, oh, this person is better than that person? The object of my anger is empty. The subject who feels the anger, I me myself, is also empty. And the anger is a movement of energy, a sudden wave, which is also empty. These three are empty and self-liberating. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a break now. Uh, say 45 minutes and come back on the hour. It, for England, that will be two o'clock. Good. Have a good break. See you then. <clears throat> Okay. Um, <clears throat> has the new Russian translator arrived? They have. Okay. Good. <clears throat> now I'm going through the the Tibetan. If you're doing this for yourself, you don't need to to read the Tibetan because uh, this text is. Um, teaching, it's illustrating how your own mind is. So it's uh, important that you understand the meaning more than you just get the, the sound blessing of the lineage. The Tibetan language is a very beautiful language. It is very well adapted to Dharma meanings. And it's a, a very easy language in which to have uh, rhyming lines, or at least uh, metrically harmonious lines. So it's very nice to chant. But the key thing is that you really work at understanding what terms like uh, dharmata, dharmakaya, dharmadhatu, and so on mean. If you have specific questions, you can send them in and We'll get to them in due course in the question and answer evenings. The Dharma is for us. The Buddha didn't need to speak. In fact, according to the tradition, he didn't want to speak. He had to be persuaded again and again. He was teaching others for their benefit not for his. So this is the central principle that when we get the teachings, it's for us. <laughs> oh, no, we, the Buddha's not sitting there waiting for us to say, oh, this is wonderful, this is so clear. 
he, the Buddha is waiting for somebody to say, oh, I've spent five years working on this and now it's getting a bit clearer because then it's talking about genuine experience and not just a kind of intellectual clarity. So we often see in text uh, a line that will say, may uh, obstacles be the path. So if you find that you have obstacles to understanding, don't uh, give up. Don't blame yourself. Make friends with the text and allow the meanings gradually to be absorbed. From the very beginning, we have been inseparable from the Dharma Datu, which is the site of all the Buddhas. But we don't see this. So oh, this is quite important. We are going to die. We don't know when we're going to die. We have some time, but we don't know how long. Today, that is each and every today, is always the best day for practice. As we know, with uh, war situations and invasion situations, <clears throat> there is a time when you can flee, when you can get over the border, and then there's a time when it's too late. Once the border is closed, you're trapped. In the same way, when we uh, go into the death process, it's too late for study and reflection and practice. All the factors of this life, which seem so very important, family arrangements, work, promotion, holidays, and so on, all of these will vanish from our mind without trace. So now we continue. He's going through the five wisdoms. He's coming now to the third. so, <clears throat> this line is again referring to the Dharma Datu in the pot of hospitable space that is the same everywhere. Every country has uh, some hills and valleys, and some places are more pleasant in winter, others are more pleasant in summer. But hospitable space or the infinite uh, openness of the mind is the same everywhere. When you say hospitable space, it doesn't mean just a, a kind of dead, empty space. It means our mind, the space of our mind, which is where everything occurs. Without the mind, there, there is uh, nothing at all. It's a dead void. It is consciousness which attributes differential value. So we have to always bear in mind that uh, in the Tibetan tradition, we have these nine yanas or nine vehicles. On the outer levels, then we can say uh, some people have more functional value than another. If you are in need of an operation, you might know that carpenters have quite sharp tools, but probably you'd rather meet a surgeon. Oh, the surgeon is more important for you. They are special for you because of your condition. So, the big Tibetan lamas, they're called Rinpoche, which means very valuable. Dear costs a lot means high maintenance. Are they more important than the carpenter or the cook? That depends. If you really like food and you don't care about Dharma, then wonderful, highly respected cook, please cook for me. 
So we have to see everything is empty. We are all the patterns of emptiness. Value is not intrinsic. When the Chinese came into Tibet, they tortured and were beating up many lamas. They had a different point of view. And say, oh, they had wrong views. They didn't realize the true benefit of Dharma. But then you are fighting about uh, the methods of attributing value. Siya Lama insisted many, many times, nothing is special. Everything is equal in emptiness. <clears throat> so if we see this, then it also allows us to see the artificiality of our conceptual elaborations. So that is not intrinsically something wrong. If you can make a, a temple which is very beautiful with many tankas and wonderful statues that can inspire someone. But if we end up thinking that some people are intrinsically better than others, then we have misunderstood Dharma. So within this uh, great open pot of all welcoming uh, evenness, there swirls the oil of uh, bodhicitta, the bodhisattva intention within the relative form. This means the, the, the two aspects. The first is like someone planning to go on a journey, you make an intention. I will work for the benefit of all. And the second is to actually go on the journey to do the practice which directly connects you with the ground whereby you link with all beings and uh, feed them love and light. On the wake of the union of appearance and emptiness, this uh, word we translate as uh, appearance in Tibetan, it's uh, nangwa, which also means light. So when it says uh, the, the union of appearance and emptiness, emptiness here is the empty quality of appearances, which does not allow them to carry the burden of projections. Like we had earlier with the example of the band. You get these two functions going at the same time. I like the band, the band is great. The subjective feeling gets projected into the object. But when we see Nang Tong, appearance and emptiness, there is no inherent existence or substance in the appearance on which you could hang your projections. So it's this that allows you to see the self arising and self liberating. So the band that you love, the lead singer has died of a heroin overdose and the band breaks up. These things happen. It's rock and roll. But they were so good. I have a ticket for the conference, for the concert. It's like that. If you see <clears throat> the, if you like the intrinsic purity of the object and you don't contaminate it with your own projection, then it is absolutely self liberating. <clears throat> And on this wick, there is burning the flame of actualizing naked awareness. This uh, term uh, and translated as actualize, usually it's translated as realize, but realize means to make real and it's not real. So you could say it's the flame of awakening to naked awareness. Rikpa. Our awareness is always naked. 
consciousness is never naked. Consciousness is concerned with qualities, interpretations, opinions, commentary. So if on, as it were, the object side, you have uh, appearance and emptiness, and on, as it were, the subject side, you have awareness and emptiness. These two have no barrier between them because they are both empty. So this is also described as meditating sky to sky. The field of experience is open and empty in which illusory forms arise and pass like rainbows. And on the subject side, awareness is open and all manner of thoughts and feelings and memories arise and pass without leaving a trace, without any stain. So, this is so important because it, what it's saying is we're not homogenizing everything into a kind of bland, uh, neutral taste. Every form arises as it is, but what it is is not what you think it is. What you think it is, is your mind layered on top of this empty appearance. So when I was a child, we at school, in the primary school, we had to do Scottish country dancing. There's a lot of you stand in a circle and everybody's clapping and moving and you have to go in and you link arms and you twirl around and you come out. It's very dynamic like that. There's nothing to grasp in it. It's just the body with the music moving and moving and moving and then it stops. Then another tune comes on, then another pattern of movement. It's a revelation yet nothing is established. So it is as it is, and then it isn't. And all our life is like that. We began some hours ago, then we had breaks, and now we're talking on something else, the words come out of my mouth, and on and on, then we stop. So, and I used to go to, a long time ago to see Nam Kai Norbo, he was very clear that you should never write any notes in a teaching. We're used to <clears throat> the idea of learning as getting something. In school, you have to absorb what's being said and read the books and hold it in you so you can put it out in the exam. But here, as I said about this instant arising red dakini, it's a, it's a feeling tone. It's not so much looking at an image, a tanka of the red dakini and thinking, oh, she looks like this. It's your own feeling tone. The movement of, uh, of uh, our experience is I say something, you hear something. If you don't hear, why am I talking? So it's a co-emergent experience. This uh, space in which we are moving is this is truly the Dharma Dhatu. This is the space of participation. If you stand apart from it and think about it, you, you're not held by the emptiness of the situation. The Dharma Dhatu is always empty, but always full. We don't have to work out what the fullness of the appearance is. It is just this, and we move with it, and we move with it. In the <clears throat> 1960s, uh, there were some changes in the production of commodities, and people started to talk about built-in obsolescence. That is to say, they were making machines that wouldn't last very long, so that you would have to buy a new one. Now, the Buddhas are saying, ah, this is not a new idea. The, the Dharma Dhatu has absolutely built in obsolescence. It's here and gone. Self-arising, self-liberating. But 
the difference of this to a capitalist principle is that here there is no gain and no loss because there is neither lack nor excess. Well, you can observe this in yourself. Yesterday is gone. It's not available anywhere. Not in the shops, not in the bank, not in your mind. A memory is not the same as the moment. One of the ripening forms of mental opacity or stupidity is the delusion that representations are the same as immediacy. When ignorance arises, <clears throat> we have ahamkara, this dugs in, grasping at something, grasping at a self. There has never been anything to be grasped because everything vanishes. But concepts grasp other concepts. And when you grasp at the concept of a self, of an enduring entity, then it's as if you know what's going on. One of the greatest insults you can pay to anyone is to say, oh, I know you. We don't know the other person. We may have some memories or we may have some projections. Each person is ungraspable. Each moment is ungraspable. So when we see <clears throat> that this uh, Dharma Datu, this open space of potential is the same everywhere, there's nothing specific that would be able to be special for me. If we don't make something special, if we see everything as equal, and we don't need any particular pattern, inner or outer, to complete us, then we're just here and open. So <clears throat> this is the, the flame of uh, awakening to naked awareness. Then with this, thoughts arising from the affliction of pride are limited in their own place. Pride means uh, I am special. I'm really good at this. That is a terrible thing to say. Hmm? Not because um, pride is a moral fault, but because I am not recognizing that I am splitting myself. Let me tell you about myself. There's an aspect of me I can describe and an aspect of me that can do the describing. I am both subject and object. Now, if you see directly both the subject formation and the object formation are illusory, there is no problem. But if you are constructing an image of yourself and hanging on to some definite view about yourself, let me tell you about myself is uh, another layer of opacity being placed over your potential for clarity. So the outer form of pride is showing off and if you have money, having a big house or a big car. But the inner form of pride is I exist. Pride in my existence, something I hold on to. This is why day and night we should be attending to the impermanence of outer and inner phenomena. Then says, uh, without being rejected, all the thoughts connected with pride dissolve in the vastness of perfect equality. In order to be superior to others, I have to be separate from others. So we might say, if we look at the Himalayas, Mount Everest, wow, that's the, that's the big one. But if you go in that area, you see that 
there are the small hills and they're linked with the bigger hills and then goes to the mountains and then goes up to the highest mountain. It's all just the earth. But this mountain is better than that mountain. Because we see the, 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 the mountains as having a kind of stability that we can put more projections onto them. Mount Everest is very important because at the top, it has a zone of death. If you stay up there for a few hours, you are getting very close to death. Wow, that's amazing. I'm going to have to do some training and collect a lot of money so I can climb up through the snow and the storms to get to this arena of death. This is madness. Samsara is a form of madness. Actually, everything is equal in emptiness. So, the identity of all things, they're equal in their emptiness. This manifests as rays of shining light in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings. We offer this to the Guru in the gods of the Ratna family, the jewel clan. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So the, the jewel family, this is the family of the Buddha Ratna Sambhava. Um, looks bright, shining, special, but it's empty. Then we have the next verse. number <laughs> So, in the pot of attention to the distinct features of all phenomena, so this refers to what we've just looked at, as phenomena arise, in an instant, they're all there. Life is always instant. If you dance or you turn your head around, you go for a walk, and you're moving, there's this and this and this and this, and it always, always all comes at once. It is instant because it's not constructed, and it's inclusive because it all comes at once. In the initial moment of bright awareness, it's all of this. But then when you uh, want to make sense of it, when you want to work out what's interesting and not interesting, then what's activated is dualistic consciousness. So what, what is referring to here is the distinct features which are there in the first blink. And in this pot, there swirls the oil of undeclining great happiness. Because in the immediacy, it is complete. Nothing is lacking. This is a basis of happiness. This is fulfilling. You are filled with the always already full. Once you start thinking about what is there, you almost like uh, taking a, a mirror and throwing it on the ground. You fragment the whole into these little shards. And you also fragment yourself into your memories, your plans for the future, your likes, your dislikes. Then you have the sad pleasure of reconstructing your world to have the mosaic of your interpreted experience. But when you look at a collage, you can see the artificiality of its structure. 
So then he says, on the wick of the union of happiness and emptiness, the flame of the energy of awareness revealing each appearance as it is burns brightly. So happiness and emptiness. This happiness is, a, as we looked earlier, it's a quality of satisfaction of, oh, this is enough, this is good. The founding uh, Buddha, the, the, the Buddha who has never been in samsara is Samantabhadra. And his name means always good. All good. About everything in every direction, every place, every time. It's all good. Now, different languages will construe this in different ways, but in English we we can make a, a difference between discernment and discrimination. So when we discriminate, we make a strong separation between the things we're looking at. So you might say to a friend in a shop, oh, don't buy these apples. They have no taste. Get these ones. They're really good. So you've made a kind of vertical axis in which one kind of apple is placed high and the other is placed low. But with discernment, we are attentive to all the nuanced details of what is arising, but without ascribing different volume. So we might say, oh, this apple has no taste. No, it has no taste. How interesting. It has nothing to do with it. It has no taste. It's neither good nor bad. But if I want a very tasty apple, then I make this apple bad. So again and again, we're being invited to observe the movement of our own mind. So what am I up to? I sit here in my ego palace, like the Christian or Jewish book of Genesis. Like God, I say, let there be tasty apples. And there were tasty apples. I say, let there be this, let there be that. That's how it should be. But it's not. No wonder God sent a big flood. I would like to be able to send a big flood into my local supermarket and wash out all this shitty food they sell. Because we might think, oh, discernment, that's fine. It's all equal. But nowadays we have high inflation. Maybe we don't have so much money. So when I get home and bite my tasteless apple, I feel cheated. How can they charge money for this? So this is what we have to observe. It's not about being right or wrong, but seeing how the, <clears throat> the assumptions which I bring into every situation about how it should be, this creates a distortion in my openness to how it actually is. So if we avoid going into this kind of discrimination and attribution of value according to a hierarchy. So with this, then each appearance is as it is and vanishes. Then thoughts arising from the affliction of desire are liberated in their own place. I am not God. I'm not in charge. It is as it is. It's like this. I don't like it. Who cares? Who cares? It's only a thought. The thought also is vanishing. There is nothing to hold on to. Desire is identifying special qualities in certain features of the field of our experience. 
this is the one I want. And as the Buddha pointed out, there are two main forms of suffering. There is getting what you don't want and not getting what you do want. Oh, desire. Oh, so desire is the royal road to that suffering. Because with desire, you, you're already formulating what you want. And it's, very often it's not available. So by releasing the pre-projection of a template of value onto the emergent field, you can have happiness with everything. So then he says, uh, without being rejected, these thoughts and feelings connected with desire dissolve in the vastness of non-dual great happiness. There is no real object to be grasped. There is no real grasper. There is just this. The more relaxed we are, the less we merge in with the arising thought and identify it as our thought and give it value and importance. When a thought is arising, if we merge with it, it seems to be important. That is to say, we, we lean towards it, we tilt into it. It is as if the potential of awareness Instead of it being a plain, impartial mirror that shows everything, it becomes a kind of distorting mirror that you used to get in the fun fair. Our own investment in the arising thought creates the distortion. And when we don't even recognize that we're doing this, distorted appearances seem normal. In that way, the subject and the object seem to be fused in the predictive validity of reality. But each moment offers itself. It's just this. And it's gone. Were you there? Were you available? I don't watch television very much, and sometimes when I do, I'm a bit tired. And I fall asleep for a minute. And then I can't quite follow what's going on. I wasn't there. You've got to be with it as it comes. It's a flow of experience. Saying this is special and looking over your shoulder to try to follow it will not help. These are distortions, relaxed, open, available. So then he says, original knowing as precise discernment manifests as shining rays of light. This term, sorry, this term, uh, original knowing is in uh, Tibetan, it's yeshe. Ye means the very beginning or the origin, and she means to know or knowing. So if you're in the house or the mode of dualistic consciousness, when you learn, you get knowledge. That is to say, you know something. But the she is not that kind of knowledge. It's not a conceptual knowledge. It's original because it's always fresh. Oh, it's like the mirror. If your car is parked, then uh, what you might see in the side and mirror is kind of fixed because car's not moving. But as soon as the car is moving, many, many reflections are arising. So oh. if you park your car, if you park your mind, your consciousness, in a fixed interpretation, this is the best one, this is what we need, then the same kind of image seems to arise, but it is an artificial construct. But we are alive. We are 
we are moving people. The senses responding, the breath going in and out. We are a moving vehicle. You have to look in the rear view mirror, but you glance at it for time to time. Because if you were looking always at the rear view mirror, you would crash. A glance is enough. Yeah, everything is a glance. Events coming, 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 coming. You cannot stop the flow of life. But if you are relaxed and open and present, you have the clarity of precise discernment. In order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru and the gods of the Padma or Lotus clan. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general real attainments. Then on to the next verse. Oh, so it says again, wonderful, in the pot of the wheel of continuous activity. This is our experience. Experience is flow or moment by moment or just this. In the text, it often says, describing uh, our situation, that it's uh, unborn and unstopped. Because everything which occurs is inseparable from emptiness, it is unborn. It has never entered into a, a separated existence. But it's also unstopped. Nothing can put an end to the flow of experience. Certainly in the Tibetan tradition, they say when you die, uh, the five elements dissolve, the various aspects of your life, the con eight consciousnesses, they gradually dissolve and they flow. But again, this arises for you as new kinds of experience. The ground of ourselves and everything we experience is infinitely open and empty. We are the empty flows of energy of the ground. From this point of view, the idea that we only have one life and then it's finished forever is uh, not very wise. So in this uh, part of ceaseless movement, which is potential, inside this swirls the oil of effortless accomplishment, free of striving. If you're swimming in the sea and you don't want to get tired, you have to collaborate with the sea. It's not about fighting it or defeating it. If you want to conquer Mount Everest, you have to collaborate with how the mountain actually is. Otherwise, the wind will blow you off. When we collaborate, we get in sync. We are in harmony with the events. We follow the middle way. We're neither rejecting nor uh, grasping and holding on to. The middle way means perfect balance. If you know the line of gravity as it moves in your body, then you can bend and stretch and so on, and you won't fall over. You've taken your place as part of the whole. You are part of the flow. And therefore, your movement with the flow is free of striving. You're not trying to impose something. On the wick of the union of clarity and emptiness, the flame of awareness free of beginning and end burns brightly. This is the flame of the all-accomplishing wisdom. 
when you have a task which has a beginning and an end, then you think, oh, that's done. And you might assess it and think, how did I do? Has it been done well? But the doing was a process. All kinds of movements were involved in the process. Doing is moving. How did I do now that it is done? It is stopped. It has ceased. From the point of view of his explanation, this is madness. Movement never stops. Patterns of movement stop. But there is a seamless continuity between this pattern and that pattern and this pattern and that pattern. It keeps moving. So what are you going to evaluate? So if you remember being at school and you had an examination and you sit for three hours writing something, then the teacher says, it's time, put down your pens. Oh, I haven't finished one more. No, nope, put your pen down. <laughs> so, now you're upset. The experience of writing the exam question and the experience of being upset, seamless. And your friend says, that was great. And the arising of your angry envy is also seamless. Life doesn't end. The flow of experience keeps coming. So it says, thoughts arising from the affliction of jealousy are liberated in their own place. Jealousy is a good way of ending life. Why were you looking at him? We've gone to the party together. We're together. Why are you looking at him? What do you see in him? This is not the source of happiness. Maybe something is going on. Maybe not, but you are already chopping your life, your little heart in pieces. What you gave me, you're going to give to him. This is a sour, bitter taste. It's a sense of loss. There's an obsessive attention to what's going on. People try to get into their partner's telephone and review the messages. They can end up stalking the person, wanting to punish them for their betrayal. I thought you were mine. We just need to listen to the words. It's kind of mad. Everything is impermanent. Everything arises due to causes and conditions. This doesn't mean, oh, it's due to the changeable moods of the one I love. It means it changes because of the patterns of karma which are arising for me. Who shall I blame? This is my life. The patterning of my life. You should not pattern my life. This is the voice of duality. The voice of karma at least says, oh, this relationship won't work. That's my luck. If we go a bit further and are clear, the future hasn't come. I want to have a future with you, but I don't know who you are going to be in the future. Uh, attachment makes us crazy. So jealousy is a, it's a destructive spiraling of energy that leads nowhere. Its structure is always triangular. Me, the one I want, and the other. 
when we stay present with the emergent moment, there is neither self nor other, nor any other. So, with awareness free of beginning and ending, if the pattern shifts and comes to an end, it's not the ending of awareness. Nothing fundamental has been lost, merely a pattern. So when we're in touch with the ever open ground, the thoughts arising from jealousy are dissolved without being rejected. They dissolve in the vastness of freedom from work and effort. That is to say, non-dual co-emergence gives rise to all kind of rich experiences, but it's, and, and moreover, it protects you from the dualistic separation of subject and object, which leads to striving. So the, the wisdom of effective action or the original knowing manifesting as effective action manifests as rays of light. In order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all beings, we offer this to the guru and gods of the karma clan. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So there are many further verses to come. But Tukotsolo has started by focusing on the five wisdoms or the five original knowings and how they function as the site of the liberation of the five poisons. Yeah, Tukotsolo, uh, uh, sorry. This is Sialama based the book on the teachings of Tukotsolo. These five verses, if we really uh, bring them close to ourselves, we can see how we get tied in knots. We are the agents of our own suffering. There is no one else to blame. Moreover, we don't actually have a self to blame. What we're concerned with is patterns of experience which are arising and vanishing if we allow them just to come and go as they do. But when we get involved, when we decide that we have to be in charge and control what's happening, that creates the illusion of suffering. Okay, so we come back at five to the hour, and then we'll continue for the day. Good, see you then. Okay. <clears throat> So this, uh, the book is very much about explaining the different views, different ways of approaching our experience of being in the world. Onions can be very helpful because when you look at the, the onion, you have the outer wrapping, and then you can slice through it and you see layer after layer after layer but there is no real center. Another traditional example is the banana tree. When, you, when it's growing up, it is a layer after layer <clears throat> loosely wrapped. So if you cut through it, you can see there is no heart or core to it. So it's also useful to look at yourself and think, well, what is my core? What is my center? What, what do you have about you that was there from your childhood? Probably not the shape of your body. Probably not the kind of thoughts you have. The things that might continue could be a sense of humor or being musical or being fascinated by nature. But maybe these are not uh, what we might say essential or defining qualities. As we go through the years of our life, aspects uh, of our uh, thinking and feeling and doing that were very important start to fall away from us and new ones arise. In terms of the body, we don't really experience um, cycles we tend to have one big cycle of the springtime of our life the summer the autumn and 
then we move into winter and death. But as we look at the patterns of our enthusiasm, they, they seem to have uh, seasons. So very, very important, and then fading, and then we can't remember why we were so interested. So again and again, observe the dynamic nature of life, the interactive nature of life, the co-emergent nature of life, so that we can see the myth of inherent existence. So now we have the next uh, verse. All Ulo shene chok tung sol. So again, the wonderful in the pot, this butter lamp pot of the ground of all bound by delusion. So again, we have some technical terms, I explain them to you. But very often in the Sokshen text, they talk about the ji or the, the ground, or the basis. And here he's talking about the kunji, the ground of all. Here, this is short for uh, kunji nambar shepa, which means the ground consciousness. So, the, gra the ground of all is actually the Dharma Datu, what we've been looking at, this open space of potential where all kinds of experience arise. When we see the emptiness of the ground of all, then it is the Dharma Datu. This is called the uh, Kunji Dumache, which means the uncompounded or uncreated ground of all. But when our mind goes under the power of delusion, that is to say, when uh, the duality of subject and object seems to be a, a simple given, the truth of our situation, then this ground of all is bound and uh, becomes false. Because the delusion leads to the idea that um, you can control the ground of all. It is uh, my ground, my garden, my field. So nowadays we have many, many insecticides. We have many weed killers and many, many kinds of artificial fertilizer. We want to kill the bad and make the good come the way we want them to. Cattle are given many, many antibiotics, which even goes into the milk from the cow. There's a lot of intentional activity in farming. This is a, an example for the, uh, <clears throat> when we don't open to the ground as it is and see ourselves as part of the ground, but when we become the owner of the ground, then we become the, the doer, the maker, the one who is going to uh, have life on our terms. Now, this is the position of the ego self when it imagines that it is a pure awareness in touch with everything and it sees the ground of everything. We know what's going on. We can make it better. But the reason we have things like uh, climate change is very much uh, due to human activity. 
each uh, activity that humans developed was within the frame of reference that was operating at the time, quite rational and intelligent. And then we realized, oh, I understood cause and effect that I could introduce this chemical, destroy the insects, and then everything would be fine. But because of the narrowness of our frame of reference, we tend to be blind to the law of unintended consequences. So we find that the soil is losing its natural vitality, that the livers, rivers are being polluted, that there's plastic in so many fish and whales and uh, many, many uh, horrible problems arise. So I'm using that example to illustrate the meaning of this first line. When we feel that we are in charge and that we have a, a kind of total knowledge, a knowledge of all the factors that are involved, this is a sign of being bound by delusion. Believing that you see the whole when you only see a part, it leads to many, many errors. And this is because when you enter into duality and consciousness arises, the structure of consciousness is, I know about something. When the open empty mirror that shows everything is thrown on the ground, it shatters and the different shards show multiple reflections. So now there's a lot of stuff. We live in a world of stuff. We even have the different bits of our body. We are a compilation, a, a, a compoundedness, a composition. As in the Theravadan teachings on the five skandhas, the five heaps. If we know there are only five, we can perhaps work out the permutations of five. But these, unfortunately, are not five simple factors. They are five complex factors. So the permutations are beyond calculation. So here we see a, the deep structural problem. The light of human beings is the light of intelligence. We can see problems and solve them and on the basis of that, take a step forward. But each small area we work on is invisible to us, connected with all the other aspects. And so these unintended consequences arise. Yet our pride convinces us that we know what we're doing. In order to stop a problem, we take decisive action. We have to invade Iraq. Our research shows they have weapons of mass destruction. Oh, we will invade. That's a good intention. What we will do once we have invaded their country and made a mess, we don't know. That's for tomorrow. This is our history as human beings. Hunting the whales to the point of extinction. So many, many examples. So the Buddhist teaching on dependent origination is very important. So on the basis of this, that arises. But this is also arising on the basis of another this and another and another. So there are huge chains interweaving dynamic patterns of co-emergence. And these complex systems with their interactive feedback loops are not uh, understandable inside a linear progressive rational interpretation. We want, we want to do well. We've done our research. We're going to do what's required. The problem with Iraq is that the leader, Saddam Hussein, is a very bad man. 
if we get rid of the bad man and we put in a good man, then happiness will come. When uh, Sia Lama would uh, comment on situations like this, he would say, only children playing. There is no understanding of emptiness or the five poisons or interdependency. Take out the bad bit, put in the good bit. This is not how the world is. So this is what this first line is talking about. If you don't see the emptiness of the ground of all the things which arise, then you see the ground as a kind of factory pumping out all these different things which you then have to understand with this fundamental misunderstanding of the basis of everything. Within this pot, there swirls the oil of many different thoughts arising from the minor afflictions, the minor provocations. Now a new hope has entered the world. Artificial intelligence. This will be very good for us. We will make sure it does what we want. We are in charge. This may not be the case. You know, the great thing is these computers, they can, they can do things much faster than we can. So what, what exactly is it they're doing? Oh, anyway, it's good, it's good, don't worry. This is exactly uh, what he's talking about here, these minor afflictions. Believing you understand when you don't understand. Then we insert the wick of belief in self-existing entities. So these, these uh, thoughts, these beliefs that there are really existing phenomena outside us and inside us, this arises from ignorance of the true ground. So these first three lines are describing a, a, a problematic constellation. However, the flame that burns from this is the flame of the great wisdom or original knowing of the absence of inherent existence. When we see that whatever we talk about, whether it's politics or economics or searching for oil in the Arctic regions, whatever it is that excites people and gives them hopes or fears, these are structures which have no truth in them. They are like banana trees. The flame is burning up the delusion of uh, reification, separation, fabrication, when we see with the light of this flame that not one single self-existing phenomena is, can occur, then the obscuration arising from the afflictions is liberated in its own place. This uh, verse is dealing with one uh, obscuration and the next verse is, will deal with the other. They come in a pair. This is the obscuration that comes from the afflictions, particularly the five we looked at earlier in terms of the five wisdoms. So this is a, a covering, a veil. <clears throat> Sometimes it's compared to a cataract that can come in the eyes. We only have our eyes. When your gaze becomes obscured, you, you see what you see with your obscuration. Now that especially my left ear is getting a bit deaf, I'm quite sure that people speak very quietly near me. I say, oh, why are you speaking so quietly? They say, no, James, you are deaf. Oh, I don't know that I'm deaf. I just know that you're not speaking very loudly. So when you notice this in yourself, you see, oh, it's very difficult to catch your own obscuration. 
we have a normalization into the situation. It's just how it is for me. So it appears to us that we live in a world of real things and we are real. And it seems obvious that some things in our world are very nice and we feel attraction and desire for them and some other things are annoying and irritating and we feel aversion for them. We don't recognize our own mental dullness. The axioms out of which we generate our notions of how the world is are taken for granted and become invisible to us. That's why the teaching is so precious. On the time of the Buddha, these teachings have been handed down one generation to the next. They haven't spread all over the world as the one truth that everyone follows. We are fortunate to come in contact with them. Now, unfortunately, when we come in contact with the teachings, the teachings say, darling, you're crazy. Now, because we have so much good karma, we are able to say, wow, that's really interesting. Tell me more. But if you say that to Donald Trump or Mr. Putin, they will not be very happy. Thank you for your kind generosity in sharing this with me. Very few people are saying that. If we just think of the words we have encountered already. Stupid, dull, deluded, obscured, afflicted, poisoned. <laughs> uh, you need to have a fairly robust ego to think this is helpful. And in times of narcissism, as we have at the moment, it's Dharma is difficult for many people to accept. You are in the wrong. It's not your fault, but you're in the wrong and you don't know how you got there and you keep fucking up. And the reason you get lost is very subtle. If you want to see how it operates, you will have to calm down, be less active, and just observe how you are. So when you are able to stay with the absence of inherent existence in phenomena, then the obscuration that comes from the afflictions which always operate on the basis of reification, they are liberated in their own place. Although karma is concerned with uh, ethics and morality, it is not the first philosophy. The first philosophy, the, the grounded philosophy, the first insight. What is more basic, more foundational is an accident in the manner of a dream Ignorance arose, unawareness arose. Oh, something is there. This initial blindness had no truth to it, but it became true. When uh, I was a child, <clears throat> we would gather on a Saturday morning in the street because there weren't many cars there. And we would play some game like cowboys and Indians. It's very important to say the first thing. Because if you say, I'm a cowboy, then you're a cowboy and someone else has to be the Indian. You're not really a cowboy. It is as if you are a cowboy. But unless everyone believes you're a cowboy, the game's not going to operate. This is us. I exist. Me too. I also exist and I'm not you. Yeah, I'm better than you. Now, when your children playing, at least 
your mother comes out of the house and says, lunchtime. And then the game ends. But in samsara, Mother Buddha comes out and says, ding, 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 food's ready. Come eat the dharma. It's very nutritionist. Oh, no, we're playing. Let us play. And that's how samsara goes on. We're living in the game. I exist. So he's saying um, the, the flame we need is the flame of the uh, insight into the fact that there are no uh, self-existing phenomena anywhere. But that requires us to be able to see. And the basis of the game is belief. Make belief, pretending. And all the suffering of samsara comes from this. An initial moment of misapprehension. Actually, there was nothing to apprehend, to grasp. It was had already vanished. But when we see, I'm deluded. I have been bound by delusion. I, I believe that everything was real, but it's not. That insight, that clarity cuts away the fantastic flower of the five poisons. You cut the root and it topples. So then he says, <clears throat> without being rejected, uh, the obscuration arising from the afflictions dissolves in the vastness of the absence of inherent self-nature in all phenomena. What obscures us is a belief in reality. Normally, we think of a polarity of reality and fantasy. When there are serious things to be done, we shouldn't uh, follow fantasy. Maybe okay in the summer holidays, but basically we need to stay with reality. But the Dharma says there is no reality. Nothing is real in the sense of being truly existent. It is illusion. This is why liberation can happen very quickly. If you awaken from a nightmare, it's over. It was never real. It was an illusion. Samsara is an illusion. But when you believe that the illusion is real, it thickens and darkens and becomes a deluding obscuration. So this is something to keep reflecting on and to examine your part in the maintenance of the veil of delusion. So then he says the great impartial or all pervading original knowing manifests its own shining light. So we take the example we had before of the mirror crashing on the ground and the, all the different pieces having their own reflections. And the fact that we locate ourselves in a particular fragment or shard of the mirror. I am British. Therefore, I cannot be European. Brexit has brought us back the dignity of poverty. We shall stand tall in our rags. Thank God for porridge. <laughs> now, this is exactly the kind of stupidity that arises when you think you see everything and you see so very, very little. So this is the, a new paradox. If you want to see the world clearly, first you have to see your mind. Stop looking out, because at the moment you are sick. You are infected with the disease of reification. But if you turn your gaze and you look for the mind, and you see, oh, my mind is not a thing. 
walking occurs, talking occurs, eating occurs, but I don't exist. I have no personal essence. My essence is empty, but not empty, empty, because moment by moment I'm filling and filling and filling. I'm not a thing. I am the dynamic display of the empty ground. And everything I encounter is the dynamic display of the empty ground. Now, if you really see this and you see the ground and you see that there is no other ground, that is to say, the mirror has never been broken. It is just this hole. Then everything is the radiance of the ground. Oh, moving within your naked awareness, a thought arises that's a car. But it has no real or self existing referent. The unborn potential of illusion constellates as a car when you say car. I'm a cowboy. It's just like that. Nothing is existing in itself. It is co-emergent with your participation. It's because of seeing this that the mind is impartial. Infinite, endless varieties of patterning of illusion can arise. All the forms of samsara and nirvana. Happy, sad, good, bad, kind, selfish, and so on. Immediate, just this experience, but ungraspable, not something, never something, no thingness, no entities, no separate, isolated facts or ex beings. So when you read texts like this, this is the meaning of clarity. Clarity in Tibetan Salwa means the absence of entities, therefore the field of immediately arising appearance is unobstructed, unblocked, undivided. So we exist in the field of clarity. In language, we're going to go crazy because we exist in the field of clarity. We don't exist in it. We move as apparitions within the field of clarity. The problem for us is the truth cannot be spoken. And yet we can never find ourselves in going in the direction of the truth unless, unless we rely on language. Language is gestural, connective. It's a mode of participation. Just as when you dance with other people, your body moves and their bodies move and there's some mutual influence. Oh, this is like a conversation. Nothing is established, but there was the happiness or the fulfillment of contact. We can only fully participate if we are available for contact. I can't be in contact with you if I am sure that you are who I think you are. If I know you before I see you, when I see you, who do I see? I project my past experience of you onto you. If we want to see people, we have to not know them. From the point of view of the ego, we might uh, feel insulted if someone doesn't know things about us. 
if we were close to someone and they forgot our birthday, yeah, we might be a bit pissed off. But that kind of knowledge is helps to build up a construct of the other. I cannot show you my freshness if you are full of stale ideas about me. Contact is always fresh. So this is very important. When you remember something about someone, this is a, this is a mental game. When you meet someone, you see their eyes, you see their posture, the look of their face. So much is conveyed in that contactful meeting. You are not who I think you are. So I'm not going to think about you. You never seem to think about me these days. That's because I love you. I love you the Buddhist way. <laughs> it sounds very strange. It sounds almost crazy. But what we need in life is a fresh chance. Not just people coming out of prison, not just people uh, recovering from any situation, but everybody needs a fresh chance. So many people who suffer uh, disabilities of various kinds have been imprisoned not just by the physical disability, but by other people's knowledge that they are disabled. So this is why in the Buddhist system, we are talking a lot about the three kayas. The Dharma kaya is like the clear blue sky. No clouds of the past, no accumulations of interpretations. In this open space, the fresh moment of arising is the Sambhogakaya. And the intuitive responsiveness of the apparitional form is the Nirmanakaya. We look before at this uh, notion of meditation as meditating sky to sky. This is like the Dharmakaya, the open sky. In this openness, there is this instant arising of whatever patterning appears. This is the pure land, the pure Buddha land of this instant revelation. And within this, we respond. Where shall we respond from? We respond from the open, empty ground, from the Dharmakaya as part of the Sambhogakaya, participating in it, in this immediate contact. Always naked, always fresh. Oh, this is what he's saying. In order to dispel the ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru, the three jewels, the three roots, and all the deities. Please accept this shining light of impartial original knowing and bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So these, uh, these, these verses are composed in quite a educated uh, technical way. But essentially what Sialama is saying is keep it simple. Don't fill the space of potential with your karmic inheritance, with your dualistic concepts. But also, sorry, but also don't see them as a problem. By not interfering, by not getting involved, they go free by themselves. If you remain at rest in awareness, which is self-liberating of whatever occurs, you will be able to have a, a deep and uh, intricate connectivity, which again dissolves. Awareness is direct. Consciousness is indirect and mediated. So this is our choice. So we meet again tomorrow. 
and uh, there are many interesting uh, verses to come. So thank you to our translators and for Pedro organizing and for everyone for being here. How nice it is to be alive and to know lovely people. So I see you tomorrow if you are here. Good night. Bye for now. Bye. Adios. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. James. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, James. Well. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, James. Bye-bye. Thank you, James. Bye. Okay. So we we have more uh, verses to consider, but in a sense, everything is contained in the first verse we looked at yesterday. The pot, the container is the Dharma Datu. Dharma Datu is depth and expansion, zabge. The depth is emptiness because no matter how much you look inside it, you don't find any substance. And yet it's expansive or light because everything that can possibly occur, occurs within it. If we see this simple point, the whole teaching of the Dharma is there. In Dzogchen, they talk of treasure and Turgel, of cutting into emptiness and opening into light. It's not different from this. These are simply uh, methods of uh, trying to uh, help us be more stable in this experience. Emptiness is wisdom, and uh, the, the light or the expansion or the connectivity is uh, kindness or compassion. When we see the emptiness of where we are now, when we see the emptiness of our own mind, that it's not a thing, then uh, there is no other. If there is no self, how can there be another? Now, in terms of our dualistic thought, we can say, ah, but something is the opposite of nothing. There's nothing in the pot, so I can put something in the pot. But this is a very limited understanding of nothing. Nothingness, emptiness, shunyata is non-dual with or inseparable from every form that arises. It's not a a quintessence or a subtle essence, it's nothing at all. It doesn't stand in opposition to anything. This is why it is an infinite hospitality, because there is no core patterning. If you are sick and you, if you have an accident and you go to the hospital, hopefully they will welcome you in the surgeons will prepare to operate. But before they operate, they are having to clean their hands very well. They wear special clothing because they don't want to introduce bacteria into the operating theater. Every specific situation offers both a welcome and an exclusion. Shops welcome customers, but they don't want to welcome shoplifters. So this is our usual frame of reference. <clears throat> but the Dharma Tattu is not like this. There is no entry requirement because nothing ever comes into it. Every appearance is already within it. So in the first verse, when it's saying the pot is uh, the Dharma Datu or this infinite hospitality, what is implicit in this 
is that the pot is not your limited ego. The uh, spaciousness of the mind doesn't own its content. It's not a possession. The notion of possession belongs within the duality of subject and object. <clears throat> so it, <clears throat> it's very important not to begin with yourself. If you're going to recite this text, you want to open in a way that will allow it to flow from your own ground, which is emptiness. From the tantric point of view, we make this transformation by becoming the red dakini and manifesting the white dakini and all the offering goddesses. In Dzogchen, we can go more directly into opening. We can do the Guru Yoga of the White A. We can do this just now. Sit in a comfortable way. Don't hold yourself too tightly in some yoga position because that's already an artificiality. Your skeleton is designed to carry the, your weight, so let the muscles relax. In the space in front of you, just to imagine a white letter R. This is a symbol of emptiness of the Dharma Dhatu. And then we make the sound of R three times and relax all identifications in our body, all notions of who we are, what we are, uh, our past, our future, everything we release in the sound of R. Oh. As you make the sound of R slowly three times, you, your gaze rests on the white R. And then with the end of the third R, the sound ends, the white R dissolves in space, and you rest as space within space. Okay, so <clears throat> we can do this together. And then we sit for just a few minutes and then return to the text. Ah. 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 Okay, this uh, infinite openness has no limit. Your body, the room you're in, my voice, the translator's voices, everything is within this space. This is the pot, a limitless infinite pot. <clears throat> because there's nothing outside it, there is no other. Because it's empty, there is no self. We have the non-duality of emptiness and the diversity of appearance. This is available all the time, everywhere. Whether good things are happening or difficult things, they are the appearance of emptiness. If you leave them as they are, without... Uh, contrivance without any form of adjustment, uh, increasing or decreasing, you will see that they go free by themselves. Okay, so we continue with the text. <laughs> Salve tombola dunga la me jumbe me chemba che 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 ba la me ransa tro ma pa ganza da me long de te kinga ransa da gie rawot se trove mare mon pa sa chindo la ma 
Chosen Sasu Sasola, Ulo Shene Chotung Odru So. So again, uh, begins a wonderful in the pot of the Dharmadatu of infinite hospital, hospitable space. This is where we are. This is the here and now. Free of the limit of the past, free of the limit of the present, free of the limit of the future. This is the ungraspability of the ephemeral appearances which arise. It's described as the Dalkyap Chembo, which means the great all pervasive. There is nothing anywhere which is not already pervaded with emptiness. So truly nothing is happening. Whatever Mr. Putin does, whatever Mr. Biden does, nothing is happening. All happenings are the happenings of nothing. This is the union of emptiness and appearance. So this is to be found in the Prajaparamita literature in, as the basis for all the developments of Tantra, Mahamudra, Sokshen. Everything is unborn yet appearing. So if you worry about people in your family, if you think, oh, how will it be when they grow up? How will they survive in this difficult world? This is the patterning of your own mind. No, but I know life is difficult and they, they don't do very well. This is the voice of the great imposter. This is the voice of dualistic consciousness. Installing concept-based concept knowledge in the place of luminous awareness. Your thoughts are empty. If you observe your thought without fusing into it, your thought will vanish, showing you its emptiness. But if you merge into your thought, if you believe that your thought is telling you the truth, it will carry you here and there and raising you up with hopes, casting you down with fears. This is your mind. Nobody can help you to relax into how you actually are. Only you can do it by releasing yourself from your grasping at dualistic formations. Of course, if you have physical tension, you can get a massage. And that helps. Similarly, when we have this uh, mental tension, the tension of grasping or holding on to something, then uh, devotion to Padmasambhava helps because you experience the rays of blessing merging into you and dissolving your fixations. The ground is open and empty. <clears throat> The key to finding yourself inseparable from the open, empty ground is simply to open and empty. That's not a very complicated idea. So if that is true, why do you grasp at thoughts and feelings and memories and plans? The, fa the, the action of grasping at these things closes you down become worried or anxious or proud or hopeful. These are closures. Now, the closure is also open. Oh, in the sky, if you're in a <clears throat> clear blue summer's day and you look out into the depths of the sky, but with the sun behind you, you see these little uh, sparks of light moving around. In the tradition, they say this is the potential of space. Pictorial depiction sometimes is represented as a tigli, as a, as a little drop of light, which is 
can expand to be everything and contract into nothing at all. This is the, the absolute truth of your thoughts and feelings. But when you fall into your thought, this openness, this unborn nature, this self-dissolving nature is invisible to you. When we experience that we like something or don't like something, this rests on the notion of the somethingness of the something we like or don't like. Whatever it is, it's an experience. Experience is emergent. It is uh, relational without inherent existence. If you hate someone, you hate your idea of that person. Because each human being, each animal has many different aspects. They are beyond summation. When you identify certain features in a person or a creature or a building or a country or a philosophy, this is your construction. It is a totalization. Totalization, anything total, is a sign of ignorance. You get to the total by adding. Adding is constructive. The infinite is neither created nor destroyed. When a thought arises in your mind, nothing arises as thought. And it vanishes. If it was something, how could it vanish? If the wave was different from the ocean, when the wave came up from the ocean, how could it get back in again? The wave looks different from the ocean, but it is the ocean. Your thoughts, feelings, memories, plans, they are the display of the potential of your empty mind. But when you grasp at it as being something, you separate it from the field, you invest it with the meaning you want to attribute to it, take it to be what you think it is and and in this very quick process this quick movement you construct again the prison of samsara for yourself it's not that you go into the prison you are born with the prison in the moment that you imagine this limited field of real entities you also are imagined. Nowadays, people are very concerned with their diet. We want to eat well, get organic food, food without unnecessary additives. Self and other are toxic additives. Do not add them to your food. Not so complicated. You don't exist before you believe you exist. But if I don't exist, who am I? Oh, you're just another Buddha. There's so many. They're everywhere. It's like this. So, in the pot of this infinite hospitable space, which is your own mind, your presence here and now, this swirls the oil of the many small thoughts that appear ceaselessly. So, we have gross thoughts, big strong ones, and we have many, many subtle little thoughts. So, we, we can look at it in terms of these three categories, positive, neutral, negative. Thoughts and feelings and experiences which are positive or negative, they tend to have a, a strong impact. But the neutral is uh, more like a 
a maintaining formation. If you go out for a walk, you go out onto the street. Oh yeah, this is where I live. This deluding thought is held in place by these subtle thoughts. In a text like this, when it says thought, it implies also sensations, feelings, memories, hopes, fear, all this kind of mental activity. So this uh, kind of neutral thought is the thought <clears throat> imbued with the complacency of taking things for granted. You're walking down the street. There's nothing disturbing. Everything is as it should be. This kind of sleepy, it is what it is, false attribution is what is meant by these subtle thoughts. And what is important in this is that they are dynamic, as are all uh, the appearances that arise in the mind. They reassure us that we know, oh, nothing's changed. The street is just the street. <clears throat> but now in the Northern Hemisphere, we're coming to the spring equinox. We're having a longer uh, sunshine every day. The sun is rising higher in the sky for us. This alters the amount of light falling on the buildings, the shadows that are cast and so on. So the thought, the almost invisible, like a tiny little gesture on your face, this subtle thought, which confirms, oh, it's the same old street. This thought is saying the present is the same as the past. It was your street yesterday, and it's your street today, and it'll be your street tomorrow. When you are flowing along in this, when you are flowing along, immersed in these kind of thoughts, you're not aware of the dharmadhatu, of the, uh, or, uh, the space which welcomes everything. You're not even present in your senses. You're asleep in the dull complacency of your conceptual assumptions. This is why uh, it's helpful to do more sitting practice so that you have uh, more calmness within which these very uh, subtle movements can start to uh, be apparent for you. So we want to burn up this oil. So we insert the wick of radiant natural light of knowing. That is to say, <clears throat> if, you, if you are in the state of knowing the inseparability of experience and emptiness, the heaviness of the attribution of inherent existence is dissolved in the luminescence of ungraspable illusory appearance. Now, I think we should take a short pause and uh, say a prayer for the mental health of our translators. Because my sentences are becoming a little <laughs> indigestible. So with this light shining out, the flame of the traceless destruction of the five poisons burns bright. Oh, these uh, five poisons, the dullness, aversion, desire, pride, and jealousy, these are patterns of energy, or formative patterns of energy, or patterning patterns of energy. They are not things. Their thingness or their power arises from our fusion with them. We invest our life energy or our prana or our narrowing intensification into them. It's like a, a basic uh, problem in mechanics. 
for the issue that plumbers deal with all the time. You have a big pipe and uh, the big pipe is joined onto a smaller pipe so that the volume of liquid going down the big pipe has to go into the small pipe. So if, if the pressure behind it is maintained, it is as if the pressure increases for the water in the narrow pipe. You can know this if you ever use a, a hose in the garden and you are spray, the water is dribbling out and you put your thumb over the end, it starts to spray with much more force. You can just do it in the kitchen as well, putting your thumb under the, the mouth of the tap and uh, adjusting how much space there is for the water to come out. So <clears throat> I'm walking down the street, quite relaxed. James is in the big pipe. In the middle of the pavement, someone has let their dog give a big poop and they haven't cleaned it away. The pipe of my attention is narrowing without any effort, as if a magical formation, the thought arises, these fucking people, we all know what this is like. When the breadth of your panoramic open gaze becomes narrowed onto a focus, the value or the intensity of the impact of the object is altered according to how you attend to it. So the first of the five poisons is something has happened. And then you have a, a reaction to that. This is movement. This is in the Buddhist text when it talks about grasping or attachment, this is what it means. And some of us have looked uh, many times when your hand is open, it has full potential. As soon as you get something like the pen, the function of the hand with the pen takes on a particular power. We know this. But what we often don't notice is that I am a prisoner of the pen. The freedom of my hand has been captured by the task of maintaining the pen in the right way. So when we talk of the five poisons, we are talking of toxic formations. And they are toxic because they lead to this retraction, this tensing, this grasping in which free access to the potential of embodied being in the world of uh, illusory phenomena is made unavailable. I like you. You seem to exist. You, you exist for me. I exist for me. I like you. This becomes a kind of funnel or a conduit for my attention to focus on you. As with the, the other poisons as well, each time you have this lock between subject and object, there's a kind of vibration which intensifies the seeming uh, existence of the polarities and the uh, value and necessity of the energetic link. So it goes back to the first line, when as with the, the Guru Yoga of the White Ah, when you awaken to your own unborn presence and you see that all experience is ephemeral, nothing to grasp. The five poisons operate within the polarities of subject and object. When the subject and object dissolve or uh, are always empty within the uh, open hospitality of the Dharmadhatu, 
then the five poisons are self dissolving. So this is the flame of the traceless destruction of the five poisons. The five poisons are forms of delusion. This is special and good, this is special and horrible. These are all interpretations which are resting on nothing. With this uh, clarity, then uh, the uh, obscuration of knowledge is liberated in its own place. So in the previous verse, we were looking at the obscuration of the afflictions, which is the gross form of these five poisons. Here he's talking about the, the cognizables, that which can be known. The, the Tibetan term shecha is meaning uh, the object of knowing, which is also the object created by knowing. So this is the, the function of reification. We impute an existence and then an agency to what it is we're talking about. When we experience the world in terms of this conceptualization, it's very, very easy to get lost. It's very difficult not to get lost. But if you relax into the unborn openness, you know that whatever is arising has no uh, truth to it. So, for example, uh, we can say the British invaded India and fought many battles and took control of India. How did the British do this? If the British did it, that would imply that everyone in Britain went to India. All of us, all together, whatever it was, 40 million people will have to travel to India. In the same way in Britain, we say all oh, the Germans started the Second World War. In every, in every house in Germany, people are sitting around thinking, fuck, it's so boring. What are we going to do? Let's invade England. Let's make a war. So we can say these shitty Germans, they did this. This is what it means here by knowledge. It means a simplifying concept which allows uh, an attribution of agency. If we say the Germans, it's a kind of homogenization as if there is some absolute uh, sameness between all Germans. And because of this sameness, I can know what they are like. Oh, I'm not surprised. That's what the Germans do. This kind of knowledge is so dangerous. It is a, a kind of pure delusion. But because our normal samsaric mental functioning is organized according to consciousness, which means knowing something about something, I can't know about something unless it is first identified as being a something. So as we looked yesterday, within the infinite field of open awareness, something arises. <gasps> it's a wave. In the ocean, there's many waves. But the shock of the wave creates a disjunction because the one who is shocked is also a wave. So this uh, pulsation of subject and object is moving together each. The movement of the object moves the wave of the subject. The movement of the subject moves the wave of the object. This is the beginning of samsara. We are if we open to the practice, we can be present at the birth of samsara. We do the three R's, we relax and open. 
And then without intending to, we're caught, we're distracted. The arising form, the object, catches the subject, which is the arising form of the other wave. Oh, you drift off for a few seconds. Then comes another thought, oh, I was distracted. I need to get back into the practice. This contains a subtle reification, a solidification. This is why in the teachings it always says, no matter how your mind is, whether it's calm or sluggish or crazy, don't follow after the thought, stay present as the openness within the, which the thought arises. But if we enter into this subtle knowledge, something happened. There was happening, occurrence, the thought is not different from its empty ground. The wave is not separate from the ocean. But this arising something. And on that reified point, there is a separation. It's different from the field. This is the meaning of ignorance or unawareness. You believe that the wave is not the ocean. You believe that the thought has an existence apart from its open empty ground. On the basis of this, all the different thoughts and feelings, the nouns, the adjectives, the adverbs, the whole uh, energy of construction and creation arises. Now, the key thing is, because all these ingredients of construction are actually empty of inherent existence, although a lot is constructed, nothing has been constructed. Your own interpretation is the maintaining factor of ceaseless constructing. The absence of inherent existence means that nothing exists by itself. You look at the houses in your street, they're there. You can't just snap your fingers and say you're nothing dissolved. But what you can do is observe how you interpret what you see. The house you observe is arising in terms of how you interpret it, make sense of it, respond to it. This seems very strange, but yet it's the basic Mahayana view of dependent origination, which says there is no that out there on the basis of this, that arises. On the basis of my age, my life history, my experiences, I interpret in a particular way. These interpretations are very subtle and because they are habitual, they are largely invisible. In the Tradition, they're compared to uh, being in a, in a valley, uh, which is a, a kind of water meadow, and uh, underneath the ground is a, in a kind of U shape, and in the middle, it's a little bit marshy, because underneath the, the grass and the earth, there's a small river is flowing. So the outward sign is that the grass along this line of the river tends to be a bit richer and grows a bit longer than the other grass. So if you went to the cinema by yourself, you see the movie, you have your experience and you come away with your own conclusions. Well, that's how it is. But if you go with someone else and you have, go and have a coffee afterwards, and you start to discuss the film. 
you start to think, hey, hey, you, you, you didn't understand the film at all. How can you say this? This kind of experience is very helpful. There is no self-existing film. It arises independent origination with what you bring to it. If you had just gone home by yourself, you would hardly be able to see your own opinion because it would just be you. Encountering the mind of the other allows you to see uh, the specificity of your own formulation. That's the basis of interpersonal psychotherapy. It's also the basis of uh, having a teacher who can uh, enter into some dialogue with you and try to illuminate the patterns that they see arising. But it's also the reason why meditation can be very difficult. You're sitting on your own cushion. Experiences arising from for you, but no one else sees it directly, only you. These are the habitual patterns of your normal way of, your normal karmic way of constructing the world you know. And in the moment, because you are merged into it, absorbed into it, identifying as it, it's kind of invisible. So if you see this, then you can see why we have these different uh, Dharma approaches like a refuge, bodhicitta, vajrasattva, and so on. They are all methods of putting a wedge between you and your habitual assumptions. It's the basis for the use of PET, for example, to disrupt the fusion into the pattern which is arising. So if we can open to this pot of the infinite hospitable space, then without being rejected, our habitual identification with these patterns of knowledge dissolve in the vastness of the absence of the inherent self nature in all beings. When, when we open to this, the all pervading natural clarity means the, the, uh, the pot covering, the, the obscuring uh, beliefs are removed, and so the light of the mind manifests as, it, as the bright illumination of everything, as the appearance of emptiness. The, it, it, the, the, the light is intrinsic, it is always there. That is to say, even the most stupid thought you have is the light of the unborn ground. That is how it actually is. It has no other source. Ignorance doesn't make anything, but it provides a kind of coloration. When this obscuring uh, veil, which puts a, a dark pattern, a solidification, a thickening onto whatever appears, when this is dissolved, when we don't hang on to it, when we don't activate it, then we see everything is just arising and passing. So on a bad day, you might feel, I hate myself, I've wasted my life, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. It's like a rainbow. I am so stupid. Is simply sound, self-dissolving. The thought is vanishing even as it arises. It is itself the display of the pure ground. <clears throat> but due to grasping, merging the deluded ego formation, which is also sourced by the ground, it merges into the arising. The dark is also a form of light. This sounds crazy. But in the tantric tradition, we have many wrathful Buddhas. They don't look very nice. 
they are roaring and shouting and they have flames and weapons. How can they be Buddhas? Because they are the expression of this infinite hospital, uh, hospitable space. They have the same ground, the same source, the same nature as uh, Tara or Chenresi. So the stupid thoughts, the five poisons, they have the same nature as the five wisdoms. They are all empty. The only difference is wisdom doesn't grasp. Wisdom doesn't grasp at the wise as self and the object of the wisdom as other. When this grasping is not operating, then it's obvious everything has the same ground of emptiness. But the thing about grasping is that it is both uh, connective and separative. So if I uh, grasp my pen, not only do I separate myself from my, the freedom of my hand, but as I hold the pen, it's also obvious my hand is not the pen. So the separation of hand and pen is revealed to me by the very act of grasping the pen. Similarly, when your mental energy is grasping at a thought as being a bad thought or a good thought, this, this uh, is both connecting and disconnecting the thinker and the thought. So then uh, he says, in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the guru, the three jewels, the three roots, and all the deities. By offering this light of awareness to the holy ones, we increase merit. And we do it for the sake of all sentient beings, which also increases merit. But staying, sorry, but staying with the meaning of this verse, the light that is offered is offered to light. I, the offerer, am light. The guru, the buddhas, the bodhisattvas, they are light. And all sentient beings, including the murderers, rapists, and torturers are also light. When we understand that, we say, please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. The accomplishment or uh, the uh, integration or the capacity to access the potential of the ground arises simply from not keeping yourself apart from the ground. So, we be, we, this verse begins in the pot of infinite hospitable space. This is my space because I participate in it. I am an illusory form moving in this space. I am grounded in this space. But it is not my space because I own it. It's not a personal possession. This space welcomes everything. So if this is true, why am I judging this is good and this is bad? Judgment is an activity. You can't judge unless there is something to judge. The root problem is reification. So taking uh, entities as being truly existent. That Ignoring of the Dharma Dhatu, ignoring of the open, empty ground is the root of all suffering. So stay with the simplicity of what arises and passes without adding your interpretive comments and evaluations. Well, that was a long journey through one verse. So now we take a break if we come back on the hour. So it's about a 25 minutes break. Good. To you then. Okay. 
So we're on page 45 in the English book with a text like this. Uh, if you really understand one verse clearly, that is enough. We will do our best to get through all the verses in the time we have available. But the main thing is, this is about you. So then he says, uh, so wonderful in the pot of the samsaric objects of knowledge. This simply means everything you know. Apples, potatoes, cats, dogs. Whatever can be named is a samsaric object of knowledge. The naming function uh, further solidifies, thickens, and uh, separates the seeming entity. All entities are not other than the empty ground. And yet, when we don't access this, we find ourselves living in this pot of things. Moreover, I am a thing. I am a thing among things. So in this pot, there swirls the oil of dualistic confusion, which generates karma and the afflictions. When we don't see what something is, we don't just sit in a state of nothing at all. We have there is the swirl of activity by which you identify things. Oh, Padra Sambhava says it's like uh, someone's out walking and they see a, a wooden post in the difference in the distance and they imagine it's a person. This is a conceptual elaboration that we don't leave appearances in their simplicity. We want to know something is appearing, or there is just an appearance. That's what's available. Oh, it's a person. By defining the object, I confirm that I'm a smart guy. I know what's going on. Now, there there is not knowing which is a sign of the absence of knowledge. And that could be uh, problematic or not. For example, I'm quite interested in clouds. I look at the sky a lot. In, uh, at different stages in my life, I learned these uh, Latin names for the different clouds. But because the the knowledge of the name doesn't seem to add any value for me, I forget the names. And so I return to simple things like big cloud, gray cloud, white cloud. That's enough. Yeah, but what kind of cloud is it? I don't know. Am I stupid because I don't know? For the people who need to know, then I'm stupid because I don't know. What will knowing the Latin names of trees and flowers and so on add to my life? I'm not a botanist. It's irrelevant. Most knowledge is irrelevant for us. The cult of knowledge makes us stupid. Naming is a function of unawareness. It is adding a name, an identification, a conceptual elaboration. None of the school teachers who I had to endure in my childhood would agree with this. Knowledge will get you through exams and give you a good life. 
So if you know the Latin name of the tree, you know something about the tree. So appearance, something appearing, or not even something, just appearing. Something is appearing. This something is a tree. And I can say a lot about it. All that I say and think about the tree has nothing to do with the tree. You can't catch the tree by sticking names on it. The tree is unborn. What you catch is a concept. That is very interesting. The actual, that which is actually occurring, appearance, you cannot catch. What you catch is ideas about it. So this is the pot of samsaric knowledge. This is all this, the stuff, the thingness that we encounter all the time, including ourselves. In this dualistic confusion, this fabrication, this construction of seemingly real separate entities, this is uh, what gra uh, generates the experience of the five poisons and the, the functioning of karma, which is to say an action directed towards an object with an egocentric intention. So in the third line, it wins, insert the wick of the non-duality of happiness and sorrow. Now it's again highlighting Happiness, sorrow, these are judgments, interpretations. Both are aspects of sensation and emptiness. This brings an uh, openness or an evenness or a non-judgmental attitude to the field of experience. When this wick is in place, when this non-duality is in place, the flame that arises from original knowing burns bright. Well, original knowing simply means not knowing things, not knowing distorted by the assumption of uh, real separate entities. Oh. You go for a walk and you see a tree. Will you honor the tree by naming it or by welcoming it, being available for it? You let it in through your eyes. You hear the wind blowing through the branches. You go close to it. You touch the bark. You smell the bark and perhaps the sap which is coming. You can lick the bark. You're allowing the potential of the tree to reveal itself. The tree gives you experience. The experiences arises in the moment and then it's gone. This is the gift of being that comes with being receptive, available. But if you tell the tree what it is, then as the proactive agent, you're in charge, you are the namer, and you are trapped within the world of your own limitations. So when we see this uh, original knowing, it means the, the quality of contact which comes from your unveiled availability. With this flame, all confused sentient beings are liberated in their own place. Our own place is actually the Dharma Dhatu, open, ungraspable, uh, welcome in our emergence moment by moment. So when this is operating, this is where we are. This is the only place that sentient beings actually are. In the here and now. Imagine, here is this tree and you close your eyes and you 
put your tongue out and you lick it and you have this experience. There is unimpeded contact, unimpeded uh, re reception of the gift of the tree. In that moment, you're just here and now, just this. We are always actually just here and now. But because we are in the miasma, in the fog of our concepts and memories and interpretations, we imagine a world which does not exist, but we are convinced does exist. So the site of liberation is always here and now. We don't have to go on a pilgrimage to Mount Kailash. We don't need to do anything in particular. But we do need to believe in Zokpa Chempo, the great completion. It's already here. This is complete. This is enough. You lick the bark of the tree. And your friend says, what does it taste like? Ah, like, compare, contrast. If you enter into that labyrinth of conceptualization, you will lose this direct experience. It's not like anything. It is as it is. That's all. Then you're here. But once you start thinking about it, by the very activity of trying to get closer to the thing, you lose the actual. You can explore this for yourself. Talking about something is a layering over of the actual by your concepts. And yet, because you are addicted to your concepts, it appears that they are taking you closer to the truth. You are intoxicated with concept. They are toxic. Toxins distort our perception. Well, you can observe for yourself, listen to politicians giving speeches and so on. They believe they are saying something important. They are talking up a storm. This is intoxication. And people like to get intoxicated. It's not clear yet if uh, Trump is a good vintage, which is uh, ripening well and will allow him to vomit his bile over everyone again and again. But it's clear that many people would like to merge themselves in this uh, group mind, in this uh, in intoxication of participation, a participation mystique, the, the the energy of the crowd that seems valid and yet is madness. We can be carried away by intellectual thoughts, by thoughts of desire and aversion, all kind of thoughts take us someplace, but, but they don't reveal the here and now. Well, then he says, without being rejected, all confused sentient beings dissolve in the vastness of the non-duality of graspable object and grasping mind. The mind that grasps, what does it grasp with? This is my pen. I grasp the pen, not just with my hand, but with my concept, it is my pen, I am entitled to use it. Both the graspable object and the grasping mind are concepts. When we see that they are both concepts, their non-duality, their lack of uh, true uh, existence or identity that will keep them apart dissolves and they become like movements in space. We are so convinced that we exist. 
I am me myself. Everything which constitutes us is arising and passing. Dualistic consciousness is ceaselessly working at trying to organize the patternings of these uh, elements which constitute our sense of self-identity. Awareness or original knowing doesn't do this. It simply reveals. It doesn't have to interfere. It's neither avoidant nor involved. Like the mirror, it just shows. The mirror is there as the reflections come and go. So, I am looking at a laptop screen. I'm talking to my friend, which is a little green light at the top. This is a movement of energy. I experience that I am talking towards a screen. I experience my weight on the seat. I experience the screen, the green light. I experience the sound coming out of my mouth, the movement of my muscles. Each of these aspects is communicative, arising in relation to other moving factors in the field. It's not that I, James, am a separate entity and I am speaking. The speaking is our connectivity. This is the meaning of the Nirmanakaya. As the energy of the field moves together, co-emergent, different patternings occur, arise and dissolve. The connectivity is talking. Now, this sounds a little bit strange because we are used to the idea of individual people with their own agency as the ones who are doing the talking. But I have no uh, desire or need to say what I'm saying. When we stop uh, this at the end of this afternoon, I hope that I won't continue sitting here and talking. Perhaps I will be so lonely that I just need to talk myself into existence. Then the words would be coming from me. And should such a sad thing happen, I hope it wouldn't last for more than one minute. Although I can't see you, I am talking with you. My talking is for you but it's not coming from me to you. We are present in this field and the quality of the connection and the task that is uniting us gives rise to my speaking and your listening. We could say that I am a vehicle for the Dharma. I'm delivering it to you but I'm not like someone driving around on a motorbike delivering pizzas. The Dharma expresses itself in the movement of connectivity. It's fresh. We are united in the fact that you don't know what I'm going to say. And I don't know what I'm going to say. Oh, something arises. Where does it come from? The one source, the openness, the Dharma Datu. Oh God, maybe James is becoming very inflated. He thinks he is the big Buddha speaking from the Dharma Datu. But everything is always within the Dharma Datu. It comes from the Dharma Datu without leaving the Dharma Datu. You also are listening from the Dharma Datu. When you get distracted, you lose your access to the Dharma Datu and you lose the access to the words that are occurring. Where does your distraction come from? Maybe there is a special devil's factory producing these 
distractions and confusions and the five poisons. The five poisons are not produced. They are not created. They don't exist. Your distraction is the movement of the mind. Don't investigate the distraction. Relax and open to the mind itself, which is always inseparable from the Dharma Datu, from all-encompassing space, from infinite hospitality. When we have this, then we see that everything is self-dissolving in its own place. This own place is exactly here, not somewhere else. If you go to Bodh Gaya and you see the place where the Buddha gained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, will that be a better place to be in touch with your mind? Probably you become more mindful of your intestines as you get diarrhea. There are many unwanted blessings that come from being in India. Wherever you are, the only ground for every experience is the Dharma Dhatu. So he's saying the great original knowing, free of grasping, manifests its own shining light. Everything is the light of the ground. This we can experience. This is ours. In order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru, the three jewels, the three roots, and all the deities. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. Okay, so then he says, Wonderful. In the pot of inconceivable, measureless love. So this uh, verse is co concerned with the four immeasurables, or the what's sometimes called the four Brahma Viharas, the, the four highest uh, abodes. So this love is, may all sentient beings be happy. May they be happy. No entry ticket, no exam before getting this love. It's just, you can have it, please. Be happy. But when we say the four immeasurables, we also say they may all beings be happy and have the root of happiness. The root of happiness is this uh, open mind, the emptiness of the mind, free of the obscuration of duality. Then within this pot, there swirls the oil of immeasurable compassion. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the cause of suffering. And the, the, the root of suffering is to be enmeshed in the obscuration of dualistic perception, which hides the empty ground of everything. Into this uh, oil, we put the wick of a very pure, immeasurable equanimity. Oh, may all beings enjoy the great equanimity, which is free of a bias in favor of friends and against those considered enemies. The identification of friend or enemy is, con is based on concepts. Sentient beings are obscured Buddhas. They are the lamp burning in the clay pot. All the lamps have the same nature. The clay pots come in different shapes and sizes. You like one shape and you say friend, you don't like another shape and you say enemy. 
all beings are equal in their Buddha nature, and when they become enlightened, they will have the same quality of the three kayas. So equanimity is to have no prejudice, no bias. And this is very uh, challenging. Everyone is entitled, irrespective of their qualities. The gentle rain of heaven falls upon the earth beneath. It falls everywhere, blessing everyone. The people we call bad, the people we call good, they get equal at attention from the rain. So this is, this is very, very challenging because it says you cannot buy enlightenment. You don't earn enlightenment. But you might think, oh, but I have studied uh, the teaching on the two accumulations. We need to accumulate merit and wisdom because they are like the two wings of a bird by which we'll fly to enlightenment. That is called the teaching in relative truth. In Dzogchen, we are concerned with, if you like, the infinite truth or absolute truth or unconstructed truth. All beings have Buddha nature. If they didn't have Buddha nature and they had to construct Buddha nature, then their Buddha nature would be unstable. All compounded things are impermanent. Houses get problems. This rain becomes very heavy and the roof starts to leak a little bit or you, some dirt fills up the gutters and then they're overflowing. Everything, when you look around, you see that everything is falling. We have to keep cleaning and tidying and sorting and rebuilding. So if enlightenment was like a, like a building, it would never be completed. But the Zorchen says uh, complete from the very beginning. Always already complete. So why did the Buddha say you have to get these two accumulations? This is called a skillful means. It gives people something to do. I exist. I manifest my existence by doing things. So the Buddha says, oh, James, stop the stabbing people. Do prostrations instead. So now I'm doing my prostrations. Oh, I like to do something. Gradually, the words of the refuge that I am reciting, the devotion of imagining the Padmasambhava in front of me, Gradually, this softens my need to act, to assert myself. So if you're doing your sitting practice, after some time, you find you get distracted. You get tired, your body gets sore. And if you're living in a Buddhist place like Ladakh, you can go and circumambulate the stupa. You see the sky, you get some exercise, you see the people. This is quite refreshing. You can turn the prayer wheels and feel you're doing something useful. The ego is being refreshed. Buddha nature doesn't need any refreshing. But because... Uh, we are trapped in the bad marriage between Buddha nature and ego. Uh, we have to also please our dark side. So when you go around the stupa, there is some spiritual blessing. There are shapes which come in through the senses. You're turning the prayer wheel. You see people with their malas reciting mantras. This creates a mood so that the, there is an encouragement on the path and also a subtle reinforcement of ego identity. Just to say, oh, in Sokhshen we relax, so you just have to relax. This is not so helpful. 
because I can't relax. I sit and after some time, I get a little bit fidgety. I become more distracted. This is why we don't sit for long periods of time. We sit 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but not for hours without moving. Because we are doing, sorry, we are doing something very subtle. We are relaxing into openness. If you are reciting mantras, you can keep going. I am reciting the mantra. But when I say I am relaxing into emptiness, this is not confirming the I who is relaxing, it's dissolving the I who is relaxing. And our Buddha nature is happy with this. But we haven't managed to uh, achieve a divorce yet. And so the ego says, yeah, what about me? And so we get irritated. This is why the Buddha taught skillful means. We have duality-based dharma practice and non-dual-based dharma practice. We have to work with our circumstances. You can't beat yourself into enlightenment. The ground, the openness is already here. I have to become available so that I can avail myself of the always already available. So, the, the practice of virtue, which uh, helps us, is very important. So when we wish uh, all beings to access equanimity, which is just the given, the openness of the ground, we wish them to have free and easy access. This is our big heart, our infinite expanse. However, each person has their own patterns of karmic obscuration. And they will have to find their own way not to be trapped in this, entangled in it, acting from it, and so on. If we really practice equanimity, then we no longer are at the mercy of attraction and aversion. And because this cannot be achieved by an act of will, a conscious decision, it ripens due to dissolving the reification, the solidification of the difference between self and other. Then from this, uh, the flame that spreads on this wick is the uh, the flame of immeasurable joy spreading in all directions. This is, uh, may all beings have uh, the joy which is not limited or tarnished by any suffering of any kind. This is not the joy of excitement of a subject responding to a wonderful object. But this is like the joy of letting go of a burden. If you've gone for a long camping walk carrying a big rucksack, when you put the rucksack down, oh, oh, you just feel so relaxed and free. All that you have accumulated in samsara is let go of. With this bright light, the thoughts arising from the five afflicting poisons are liberated in their own place. That is to say, the basis for involvement in them is gone. Their power is the power we give to them. They arise and go. If we go into a reactivity or fusing or trying to get away from them, this generates the glue which binds us to them. They dissolve in the vastness of the great infinitude of the immeasurable. This is another way of referring to the Dharma Datu or the, the welcoming space of the unborn mind. 
It is all inclusive. Everything which occurs is within it. it. Everything which occurs is true to its ground. Every reflection you see in the mirror is a reflection. You look at the reflection and you say, oh, this is beautiful or this is horrible. These responses are conceptual and affective elaborations. Everything in the mirror is a reflection. The reflections cannot come out of the mirror. They are inseparable from the mirror or non-dual with the mirror. No matter how they look. Oh, this is uh, so important. Appearances are very, very different in their appearance. This is the variety of the creativity of the patterning of empty appearance. Nothing to grasp. But this is horrible. You say. You say this, you think this, this is your thought projected onto the image. Don't swamp the tree in Latin words. Allow the tree to touch you. When you open your eyes, in one second, the whole tree is available. And then that moment, that experience is dissolved. Then you're looking at something else. This is the same with the five poisons. They are their actuality, the truth of how they are is self arising and self dissolving. But when conceptualized within the framework of duality, they appear to be strongly real, acting from me to someone else. When we stay with the infinite here and now, the inconceivable non duality manifests its shining light. So we say, in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru, the three jewels, the three roots, and all the deities. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So, whenever we get some insight, whenever we seem to uh, achieve something, we should always offer it to all the Buddha, share it with all sentient beings. In the tradition, they say that just as a river becomes more powerful by tumbling down the mountain, so the yogi becomes more clear by destroying her meditation. If you hold on to what you've got, it will imprison you. We're not trying to construct something or build it up. We are opening to the always already open and so break it free let it go and it will always be here okay so now we have a break and we're back on the hour in 48 minutes or so have a good break bye for now <clears throat> okay <clears throat> So let's continue. Oe jokum pama jepe gomboro, jungi kama jempe makuki. Dinans of water de pe dombula yedo onwa jumper rebe ki. Zoe ninje namdo rapti para la sam number dambe meche para da shen chelme. Topra Ransa Dro Miche Migme Chindu Londu Tim Rande Lame Sokchan Wundu Tse Drowe Mare Munba Sachin Lama Chosum Sasum Hasola Ulo Chene Chotum Odru So it says wonderful in the pot of knowing all beings to be my parents. So this is a general Mahayana idea. 
it's taken to be a fact because we've been in samsara such a long time, being born again and again in different realms. There has been opportunity for all beings to be our actual parents. Moreover, we, we are family. Our parents' ground is emptiness. Our ground is emptiness. In English, when we say they are our kind, it means like kin, family. And we have kindness, being kind to other people on the basis of their being our kind. Well, we have many kind of self-help groups. People support each other on the basis of having something in common. Could be liking to play music together or liking to repair old motorbikes or having a particular sexual orientation or interest. These are factors that small groups of people might have in common. This binds them together and makes them different from other groups. But our kind, our group is vast. We are all children of emptiness. We all have Buddha nature. We all have been helped by others who were our parents in past lives. And we all have obscurations that we need to release ourselves from. So these are the factors of our inclusion of everyone. And again, when we say, uh, you were my parent, means however you are now, whether you are in a hell realm or born as a snail or born as a worm in someone's stomach, whatever form you are in, I still recognize you as having been my parent. That is to say, my relation to you is not defined by the qualities that you're manifesting at this moment in this life. So in this pot, there swirls the oil of remembrance of the kindness with which they have held me. Some of our parents, in order to protect us, did very uh, harmful things or negative things. They might have stolen food to feed us. Due to this, they generated negative karma, which now brings them into a limited existence. Now, this is not the general requirement, but what you can do is reflect, oh, because of all the sacrifices these people at various times have made for me, they generated negative karma, which gives rise to their limitations. I have a debt of gratitude to each and every one of them. That is to say, when I approach sentient beings, I don't have entitlement. Nowadays, we're very concerned with human rights and entitlement. But this is starting in the other direction. I have a debt of gratitude. I start from disadvantage. I have to make reparation. So as we were looking before the break, these are ways of massaging your mind, softening your mind, so that by imagining these different situations and scenarios, you don't hold, your, you don't hold yourself apart from others. Um, we, <clears throat> we have to remember our uh, obligation to them. We have a duty to repay all that they have done for us. This is uh, an anti-individualist point of view. Sometimes when we're young, we want to be free of our families and make our own life. But here is saying, no, obligation is deep and has to be repaid. <clears throat> our tendency. <clears throat> our tendency to say, me first, what about me, I want, 
this is often very powerful. And so these kind of reflections are ways of softening the, the seal, the, the, the shell around us that cuts us off from deep connection. So on the stick of the desire to repay their kindness, the cotton of very beautiful love is wound well with the power of tender compassion. <clears throat> that is to say that the ego self desires autonomy. What is it I want to do? I start from myself. So we looked earlier today that if we go deeper, our true starting point is always the Dharma Dhatu, the uh, infinite uh, hospitality of emptiness. And on a more uh, relative level, my obligation is to these beings. That is my starting point. I am for the other. So the texts say that the Dharmakaya, the awakening to your own mind as it is, this is for yourself. This is your share. When you have this, the form kayas, that is to say the Samboga kaya and the Nimanakaya are for the other. The world that's revealed as these patterns of light, this is the field within which I can be for the other. And my movement, my apparitional movement within this, the Nimanakaya, is for the other. <clears throat> so this is what <clears throat> this is expressing that I, I'm not <clears throat> I'm not in the world uh, hoping for gain, fearful of loss, thinking about how I can get the things I want, but having the satisfaction, the completion of recognizing my original face. The energy that flows from that is for the other. Then the flame of the most excellent purity burns bright. It is pure. Our intention, our connectivity is pure because it's free of selective bias. Thoughts of the absence of connection between oneself and other are liberated in their own place. So if I have a, a strong sense, I don't care about you. If I merge into that, then I seal myself apart from the environment. But if I see that it is arising from emptiness and that it is actually a, a, a patterning of the potential of emptiness, then it's passing through the space of intrinsic connectivity without disturbing it. And so these thoughts of separation dissolve in the vastness of great compassion with and without an object. Oh, great compassion uh, embraces all beings. When it has an object, it's intentional. Either I want to help beings because they've been my mother or I want to help them because they lack uh, access to the Dharma, and I have that access. And uh, the, uh, the compassion which has no object is the direct experience of the emptiness of all formations. Why is this compassion? How could the just openness to emptiness be compassion? Because the realm of emptiness is without any barrier. It doesn't have an, a limit or an end. And within itself, it has no divisions. And so there is immediate connectivity. And with this, the light uh, of our own result of unsurpassed complete enlightenment is shining. Complete enlightenment is the ending of duality. There are two aspects to approach this. One is to awaken to the ground of emptiness. And the other is the kindness or connectivity that sees no separation between self and other. These aspects are complementary. 
So we need to develop both. In order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru, the three, jewel, the three jewels, the three roots, and all the deities. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So if you're reciting this for yourself or reading it and studying it, again and again, look at how your habitual concepts can isolate you from other people and uh, then observe how you can uh, open yourself to unborn connectivity. This is the connectivity implicit in everything partaking of emptiness. So, in the pot of very pure morality. Now he's going to go through the famous Mahayana paramitas the transcendent qualities that are the basis of the bodhisattva's path this morality this uh, attention to practicing virtue and not practicing non-virtue is very pure because it's inseparable from emptiness and in this pot there swirls the inexhaustible oil of very pure generosity there is no end to giving or sharing. Sharing is how we participate. Your life is based on your breath. You breathe in, world into you. You breathe out, you into the world. <laughs> Generosity is operating on so many different levels. There is the outer sense of offering to the guru and uh, three jewels and so on. But uh, <clears throat> the more direct form of generosity is your interruptibility. When you uh, make a commitment to help others, you give them the power to interrupt you. Whether this is children or uh, patients or pupils in a school or um, parents i am here for you i am available you can interrupt me of course our ego self has many trajectories many wishes many plans we would like to fulfill but life happens you plan to have a little break, but the child gets sick and you stay awake all night. So this is uh, the more intimate form of generosity. But again, it's very important to keep this in emptiness. It's not about being a hero or a martyr. It's not about making a sacrifice. It's about just the nature of connectivity. On the stick of very pure concentration, of being able to maintain attention without self-disturbance, with the very pure attitude of diligence, of uh, keeping going, uh, carrying through, not getting, uh, losing one's way, the cotton of very pure patience is tied. So, patience is non-reactivity. The, the true form of patience is to be able to allow each arising moment to dissolve in emptiness. We become impatient when we feel 
I need to do something or that shouldn't happen. And you know, there's a, an arousal, uh, a movement to change the sick, this situation. Oh, very pure patience means the mind resting in its own empty ground. Then with this, the flame of very pure true knowing burns bright. This word, uh, sherab or pradnya, means uh, a discernment, seeing very precisely the distinction or in the field of occurrence. By having this uh, clear attention <clears throat> to the details of the emergence, we also know that it is dissolving. It is very pure because this uh, clarity of attention sees both the emptiness of all phenomena and how they appear. So when these six factors are operating, the desire to privilege one's own welfare to make my benefit more important than yours, this dissolves in the vastness of benefiting others. So we can remember the three uh, styles of bodhisattva practice. I am going to get enlightened. And then with my enlightenment, I will act as a guide. So I will go first. Or I am with you. We are all in this together. I will gain enlightenment at the same time as you and accompany you on this experience. Or we decide, may I be the very last being to gain enlightenment, the very last one to leave samsara. I will not, I will not leave until all other beings are free. The third one is very powerful. Essentially, it says, what other happiness do I have except your happiness? This is an amazing orientation to have. In, in the Mahayana practice, they often say, let the other win. Don't go into competition. Let the other have the prize. Let the other have the promotion. This is not only a beautiful attitude, but it's very helpful. Because even if you are a good person and you want to be a kind person, when you keep putting the other first, this is like putting little bits of cheese behind, beside the mouse hole. And eventually the little mouse of me first. What about me? I mean, I am important. That mouse will come out. So this is very wonderful for meditators. My shadow is being exposed. And now I can let this self-referential orientation dissolve in its own emptiness. With the increase of power, compassionate method, and aspiration, the transcendent original knowing manifests its own shining light. The compassionate method is to learn many things that will benefit others. For example, if you have children and you want to help them with their homework, you find that the way they are being taught in school is not like when you were at school, and so you also have to learn. Say that the Buddha taught 84,000 dharmas. These are instructions and methods for overcoming the root poisons. So we also can learn many different methods. How to listen, how to speak. All kinds of learning are possible. And this is uh, empowered by our aspiration to be of benefit for others. This then allows the uh, natural light or the intrinsic uh, luminosity of the transcendent original knowing that never strays from the 
open ground of emptiness. So again, he says, in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru, the three jewels, the three roots and all the deities, please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So we say, wonderful in the pot of the finest pure morality. I mean, although you see the empty nature of every possible activity, be very precise and practice uh, good behavior, sweet speaking, supportive activity. In this pot swirls the oil of the Noble Eightfold Path. This is the fourth of the Four Noble Truths, the path that leads to freedom from suffering. Oh, this is well-known um, right view, understanding, speech, action, way of living, exertion, recollection, and meditation. The way of viewing, understanding, how to speak, how to behave, good livelihood, how to support yourself without harming others, exertion, uh, being uh, not falling asleep or getting distracted, recollection, which is uh, mindfulness of your uh, presence in this moment and uh, meditation. Then on the wick stick uh, of unwavering, steady, absorbed contemplation, we wind uh, the nine methods of mind control and the four aspects of mental development. These are the stages of bringing your mind into unwavering stability. With this, you get the result of the perfect attainment of the six powers. That is uh, the power to hear without distraction, to think about something again without distraction or elaboration, the power of memory, of being able to uh, mob mobilize knowledge in the service of the task, the power to maintain exertion, and the power of full understanding. In the story of Milarepa, he was able to maintain recollection of why he was in this uh, work camp with Marpa. I'm here for the Dharma. Other people came, received teachings and left, but he was made to build towers that were pulled down and he had to rebuild a different shape of tower. He didn't get distracted. He maintained his exertion, his mobilized activity. So when we read the biographies of these great the heroes of the Dharma, the great uh, women meditators like Machik Labdun and so on, they went through many difficulties and they manifested all the qualities, the Mahayana qualities, which are being mentioned here. The flame of true knowing, the knowing of emptiness, which arises from study, reflection and meditation burns very bright. <clears throat> that is to say, although everything is already within the Dharma Dhatu, it will be difficult to awaken to this if we are not disciplined. 
we need time for study, time to apply this study to our own life situations, and time to do our sitting practice. The meditation you don't do today, you will never do. Tomorrow we'll have tomorrow's meditation to do, tomorrow's activities to fulfill. So if you say yes to Dharma, you have to say no to the world. There are many things you can't do. You can't go for a walk because the sun is shining. You can't meet a friend and to have a chat. But what's wrong with doing it and being friendly? Oh, your friend tells you that their mother is dying. Oh, that's so sad. Become very close to your friend's sorrow at the, the deep sickness of their mother. Is this virtue? Where are all sentient beings? Well, I'm concerned with my friend. Yeah, that is your concern. That is self-concern. The path of Dharma has many, many hidden obstacles. Our view should be as vast as the sky and our activity as precise as the point of a needle. So then he says, judgmental thoughts dissolve in the vastness of complete freedom from thoughts. The mind itself is the space within which thoughts move. When it says uh, freedom from thoughts, it doesn't mean that no thoughts arise. It means that you don't get involved with these thoughts. If you observe your relationship with your own thoughts, you see you are psychobulimic. If your mind is like the fridge, you go to the fridge, you get some cheese, you eat it, you go back to the fridge, you get some cake, you eat it, you go back to the fridge. Day and night, you go to this fridge of your mind, a little snack, a little tasty something. Leave the thoughts alone. The thought is self-arising and self-vanishing. You are satisfied. You don't need to go to the fridge. Peaceful. Thoughts come, thoughts go. When you can easily let all the thoughts come and go, you have no need of judgment of good thoughts and bad thoughts. Within this uh, open freedom, the completely pure three trainings manifest their own shining light. These three trainings are a very common way of organizing all the Buddha's teachings. There is training in morality and in absorbed contemplation and in uh, wisdom or true knowing. If you see the empty ground of all thoughts, these three trainings are fulfilled just by that. We have to remember, like when we started with the Guru Yoga of the White R. If you start with the ground, it's the quick path. The ground is where we already are. So if you start where you are, you've already arrived. But if you start from the outside and you're trying to improve yourself and work harder, then that's more difficult. So we take this shining light and in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all beings, we offer it to the guru the three jewels, the three roots, the deities, and we say, please accept this and bestow supreme and general accomplishments on us. Ungar 
Wonderful. In the part of the outer vessel of an entire human skin. That's obvious. We take the skin off someone, spread it out. Within this, there swirls the oil of the inner contents of flesh, blood, and bones. On the wick stick of the shining heart and channels, the heart is the, the great shining source of energy in the body. It pumps the blood out to uh, bring replenishment to every part of the body. It is shining with life. And around this is wound the cotton of the, the organs, it's, uh, kidneys, bladder, and so on, and the, el the entrails, the, the bowels made from the five elements. That is to say, all the aspects of your body um, are uh, burnt up, the flame of all these radiant components, all the aspects of yourself which uh, cause you to have this specific life, they burn brightly. When you see that all the aspects of your body are interdependent, then the debased illusory body dissolves in the vastness of a mass of light. If you say, my heart, my lungs, my liver, then you are talking like a butcher. When your heart is in your body, it's connected with the blood and through that with the liver, with all the organs. This is one interactive system. It's not made up of things. This body is a body of light in a field of light. There is, it's only the, the patternings of emptiness. There are no entities or true existence within it. The illusory body, the illusory nature of our own body is not awakened to because we keep thinking it's a thing made of things and parts, like an old car. The diversifying energy of the original knowing of natural presence manifests as shining rays of light. When you see the empty ground of your own awareness, my mind is not a thing. And you see, oh, there is only two aspects, and they are inseparable. There is stillness, which is the empty, open mind, like the sky. And there is movement, which is like the wind blowing in the sky. So this rangsal, this uh, self-expression or uh, intrinsic energy, is just like as if the sky is breathing. And this manifests as rays of light, which go out and touch all beings. In fact, these rays of light are the truth of everything. They are experience, free of the division of subject and object. So, in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru, to the three jewels, the three roots, and all the deities. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments or kunji kamda yambe kumburu tenche kunta mumbe makuk taze mare paye dombo la ngoshe drepa nieke rebati kunkya rebaranda meche ba tenche kunta mare insu te tame be ishi wase tse droe mare mumba sachindo Lama Chosum Sasum Satsola Ulo Chene Chutung Udruzo Ho in the vast pot of the pervasive ground. So, again, as we looked earlier when we were yesterday, the Kunji, the ground of all, it's on the cusp. It's it could be tilted to awareness or it can be tilted to unawareness. The ground, sorry, the ground is empty. It's the ground of everything and everything is empty because the, the child comes from the mother. It belongs to the same family as the mother. The mother is empty, the child is empty. 
this pot is vast. It includes everything. Everything is arising and self-liberating, inseparable from the ground. However, when this, when the first thin uh, haze or veil or moment of unawareness arises, this same ground becomes the ground of everything. So within it swirls the oil of simultaneous, discriminating, and complacent ignorance. Complacent means, uh, oh, that's how it is. Never mind. It's okay. So <clears throat> we can say ignorance or unawareness. When there is unawareness, then the self-illuminating quality of awareness is unavailable. That is to say, no one is aware. Awareness is self-luminous and has no basis for solidifying itself as a subject who is aware. It is awareness which is aware of the emptiness of everything. But when there is a, a moment of contraction or separation, then not seeing the ground becomes ignoring the ground because the birth of the subject and the birth of the object arises from unawareness of the ground. Okay, so when, <clears throat> when there is this momentary contraction or tensing up, the, op the relaxed openness of awareness is unavailable. It is, this gives rise to a kind of what? So that vibration, what, is the separation of subject and object. Both subject and object are the empty play of the mind. They, they are the energy of awareness. But now there is unawareness of this open, empty ground, and it appears that subject and object are two. So the first is Klenchi uh, Chepe Maripa, which means uh, co-emergent ignorance. That is to say, I'm here, but I don't know where here is. Or traditional example, you're sleeping in your bed and dreaming, where are you? You're in your dream. But the dream is an illusion. You're in your bed. But when you're in your dream, you don't know you're in your bed, you're in the, your dream. I'm James. The ground of James is open and empty. James is processes of emergence interactive with the other factors in the field. That's the actual which is revealed in awareness. But when I don't see that, the I that is born from the fact of not seeing that, then doesn't see it. And I insist I'm me. I'm me is my dreamlike identity. I am safe in the bed of the Dharma Datu, but I'm asleep in the dream of separate existence. This gives rise to the second aspect of uh, ignorance or unawareness, which is uh, discriminating. Kuntu Takpi Marikpa means the unawareness which labels everything. The freshness of direct experience is being uh, obscured by my increasing reliance on conceptual identification. This is a, a very subtle in the mind. It's relating to what you can experience in profound meditation. But uh, to give a, an outer example, I walk in the park, I see an oak tree. It's an oak tree. 
I know what it is. I name it as an oak tree. I'm satisfied it's an oak tree. James, come and lick the oak tree. Why would I do that? It's an oak tree. Smell the oak tree. Why? Don't be disgusting. No, it's an oak tree. My knowledge that it is an oak tree is acting as a screen to the direct experience of whatever this emergence is. I am privileging conceptual interpretation over direct experience. The more this goes on, I'm convinced I exist, I'm me, I can define myself, I can define everything I meet. And this gives rise to the third aspect, which is the ignorance of being uh, dull or stupid towards the nature of karma. I'm me. I exist as me. If I steal from you, I'm still me. If I help you, I'm still me. My existence is a possession of me. So this is why I can feel I can steal something from you. You didn't know I did it. I won. I got away with it. Ha! I don't see that in order to steal, there is a formation of my energetic uh, organization such that I have to hide, I have to cheat, I have to lie. And this all has an impact which will arise later. So these, uh, the functioning of these three uh, aspects of unawareness seals us inside the uh, isolated prison of ourself. On the wick stick of the ignorant belief in inherent self nature is wound the cotton of the obscurations arising from the afflictions and false knowledge. So the stick is the belief that there are real entities having their own internally defined identity. And around this is wound the cotton of the obscurations arising from the afflictions and false knowledge. These uh, two uh, obscurations were discussed in two of the earlier chapters, uh, verses. The flame of the natural radiance of all pervading awareness burns bright. That is to say, awareness is effortlessly illuminating. It's not illuminating in the way that you might shine a torch on something. The mind, the awareness, is the bright arena within which all experience is moving. What we have access to is experience. And this experience only occurs in the mind. It is directly, automatically illuminated in its arising in the mind. To see, oh, this is non-dual experience. I have falsely interpreted it as separate subject and object, but it is non-dual experience. Then simultaneous and discriminating ignorance dissolve in the vastness of hospitable space. Whether you are caught up in a dream or a nightmare, when you wake in the morning, it's gone. The dream dissolves in the light of day. We are dreaming. Samsara is a dream. It is imagined. It is mental activity. I was born in Scotland. So I can imagine, oh, I'm British. If immigrants come to Britain and they get their papers right, they also start to imagine I'm British. 
both identities are imagined. Being born in the country doesn't make the identity more real or true. It's just that you're better at imagining it. The ignorance of imagining that there are self-existing entities, each having their own qualities, this is a darkness which dissolves when you awaken. Well, James, come on. If it's that simple, why don't we all just wake up? That's because we believe that the darkness is light. In the dream, we dream that we are awake. This is delusion. And if you believe in the delusion, you don't want to let go of the delusion. Someone says, oh, in Buddhism, they talk about enlightenment and liberation. Then we say, oh, nonsense. I'm awake. Look at my life. I'm doing really well. I have money. I have a place to stay, someone to kiss. I'm a good guy. So then he says, the original knowing of natural presence, free of reification, manifests the shining rays of light. Means this uh, natural presence means the uncreated, the uncontrived, just as it is. When you directly see the as it is, then there is no basis for solidification and reification. So, as the rays of light shine out from this, we want to offer this for the sake of all beings. So we say, in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all beings, we offer this to the Guru, the Three Jewels, Three Roots, and all the deities. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So this next one is much easier. Wonderful. In the pot of the five sense organs, such as the eyes, so we have these sense organs. Inside this swirls the oil of the five desirable qualities, that is to say, the objects that we are revealed to us through our senses. Then on the wick of the five grasping sense consciousnesses. So this is the traditional idea you have uh, five senses, five sense objects, and five sense consciousnesses. These are organized by the, uh, the mind, the consciousness, the dualistic mind. Its organ is seen to be the heart. Its object is what is revealed directly through the five senses. And its consciousness organizes this, uh, as it were, raw information into the conceptualized uh, way that we uh, see things in the world. So on this uh, pot and oil and wick, there burns the flame of the self-liberating, non-grasping performer of all. The performer of all is the energy of the mind, which never leaves the mind. For example, the mirror shows many different reflections. The, if you like the uh, performer of all the reflections is the clarity of the mirror. It shows the reflections without having to make them. They arise instantly. When you relax your dualistic interpretation, you will see that all your experience arises instantly, fully formed, and then vanishes. Okay, 
we're just going to stop. We're going to stop very soon. So just as the mirror shows everything instantly, when awareness is open to its own ground, it reveals everything instantly. No one is doing it. It is the intrinsic capacity of instant uh, presence or showing or revelation. This is not something separate from the mind. And it's self-liberating, so it never becomes established in, in some kind of uh, apartness. It doesn't grasp anything, but also you can't grasp it. When you grasp at your mind, when you think about thinking, concept, grasp, concept. No concept can grasp the mind, although the mind is the illuminating ground of all concepts. When this light is burning bright, then ordinary understanding dissolves in the vastness free of decline. This term, Tamal Gishepa, uh, can be a, a high term in some systems, often in Mahamudra. Here it means something just ordinary dualistic mind. It means when you think you know something, I know we should take a break. I know this, but it's not a thing. So I'm moving on. Whatever we know is an idea which dissolves. It leaves no residue when it resolves. It is empty. The movement of the mind doesn't create anything. And because its appearance is unborn, nothing ends. This is ceaseless. Due to this, the non-duality of subject and object manifests as shining rays of light. There is uh, no separation. Everything is experienced non-dual with awareness. In order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the Guru, the three jewels, the three roots, and all the deities. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. Okay, so we take a break now for 20 minutes and we're back on the hour. Good. See you then. Okay. So in that uh, last verse, in the English version at the page, at the top of page 58, when it's talked, yeah. Oh, you don't see me. Oh. oh, strange. The video should be, oh, the light is not on. Is something stopping the video? Oh, yeah, now it's come back on. Good. Okay, so in page 58 of the English version, the was the, the last verse that we did at the top of the page. Uh, I think the, we can improve the translation. It means like uh, our ordinary understanding, which again doesn't have a, a kind of factory or a production system different from awareness. It is neither tainted nor tainting, and it dissolves in the vastness. Means that uh, your mind, with its thoughts and feelings, its hopes and fears, is not conditioned by this, because it's not a thing which is acted on. It shows this distortion. So I, it's not so easy to do this with the camera, but you can see my face. Ah! 
that. So here I am. Oh, hello, how are you? These are not distortions. This is the body moving according to circumstances. The body is in dialogue with the environment. There is no normal or fixed position. So in the same way, the mind can be full of depression or hope or anger. This creates a turn like me twisting my body. You could say my body is distorted, is torted, is twisted, but it's not fixed, it comes back. The distortion doesn't change anything or establish anything, it's a pattern. All the patterns of our body are possible patterns of a body. All the patterns of your emotions are possible patterns. If you have a tendency towards irritation and anger, people who know you might think, oh, uh, you are an angry person. But this is an unhelpful, reifying conclusion. Sometimes you're not angry. You're not always angry. Clearly, you're not an angry person. We might, we might say you are a person who has a tendency to become anger, angry under certain provocations. Nothing is um, made permanent as, as a fixed twist or distortion. That is to say, your karmic tendencies are dynamic and operative and insistent, but they are not essential or intrinsic. So this is very important because this means, yeah, you, you, can, you can change your behavior, but you don't have to change your behavior. There are lots of angry people in the world. There are lots of subservient, adaptive people in the world. The key thing is to uh, see how these tendencies arise and that they have no uh, inherent existence and they don't do any permanent damage. You are not spoiled and you are not spoiling. From the very beginning, the basis of our manifestation is pure. Oh, for example, you can read about the 84 Mahasiddhas. Some of them were very, very strange in their behavior. Living on an island with dogs, uh, not speaking to anyone, being frequently disturbed, drinking a lot, all kinds of uh, intense behaviors. So oh, we have the question, how shall I live? How shall I be? The Dharma position is be according to non-duality with the ground. If you remain aware of the empty ground of how you are and the empty nature of the field you move in, then this will bring a precise uh, non-reifying contact into everything you do. No. Nothing that you do can spoil the intrinsic purity of your mind. But you can behave in ways that make you a real pain for other people. No. So you might decide, I want to live according to uh, petty bourgeois conformity then no one will find fault with me. This is unlikely. We can always find fault with other people. The old saying is you can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. Even for the Dalai Lama, when he comes to give some big teaching in the West, outside the hall, there are people protesting and saying he is a very bad person. 
So what uh, this line is saying, be true to the ground, see the emptiness of how you are, and then this will self-liberate the five poisons so that however you manifest will simply be itself and empty, and some people will like it and some won't. Chipper <laughs> Rowe Mare Mumba Sachin Du Chanda Junchen Lama Doche Chang Josun Sasun Kosun Latsola Pulo Jene Chotung Odrun So So he's saying Wonderful in the pot of the view beyond the reach of thought. Well, this is the view where the viewer is empty, the Whatever is viewed is empty, and the act of viewing is also empty. This is the mind like the sky. Within this swirls the oil of meditation free of preconceived objects. So with some kinds of meditation, even before you sit down, you know what you're going to do. You're going to focus on white Tara or green Tara, you follow the description of the text of the sadhana. In that sense, the Tara is the miktat, the, the object that your mind can fix on and elaborate the visualization. So when we do the Guru Yoga of the White R, we also have a miktat to begin with. This R in front of us is simple form of emptiness with the rainbow light of the five wisdoms, the five poisons and everything around it. And we make the sound of ah, and at the end, this dissolves. There's nothing fixed for my mind to rest on. I'm not resting on anything. Whatever comes, comes, whatever goes, goes. If my mind is caught up in dualistic grasping, I'm trying to make it happen the way I want. This is impossible. Therefore, relax. Don't get involved. It is as it is. Don't solidify, don't judge. If the mind is dull, stay with the dullness. If your mind is excited and jumping about, stay relaxed and open with the jumping about. Why do we do this? Because our view is open like the sky. The sky, certainly in London, the sky is generally full of clouds at this time of the year. The clouds are frequent, but not intrinsic. I might think, oh, every time I look at the sky, I just see clouds. Ah, oh, but they are different clouds. And the wind is blowing and the clouds are changing shape and they're doing all this wonderful dancing just for you. And the reason that these clouds can put on such a performance for you is because the sky doesn't control them. The sky says, we're gonna have a party. I provide the space. You guys bring the music, the booze, the cakes. So then we have storms and bright fluffy clouds, all kinds of things coming and going. The same with your mind. If you like, on a fundamental level, you are the openness of your mind. Because it's open, it doesn't control the transient content of the mind. Now, you are both 
the content of your mind and not the content of your mind. If you were always the content of the mind, you would just be at the mercy of what's going on. That's called the state of being a sentient being wandering in samsara. So, the, the sambhogakaya, the mind relaxes and opens and everything arises and changes and changes. We sit in order to become familiar with this. Now you have a definite clarity. The content of the mind is always changing. When you get up from sitting, you are a movement within the field of movement. Your body shifts if you go to the toilet or you make a cup of coffee or you go down the stairs to go shopping. You get interrupted by various things. Perhaps I go out of my front door and then I see, it. oh, it's quite cold. I don't have hair on the top of my head, so I have to go in to get a hat. That is to say, because I am in a dialogue with the movement of the environment, I don't have a fixed intention. I can't say I will always wear a hat. The hat is valid according to the temperature. We respond to circumstances. Nothing is fixed because everything is in dynamic connectivity. So that's the, our state of meditation. And as we arise from it, it says on the wick of immeasurable activity. In the morning, how will I know all the activity that I will perform in the day? I go into the kitchen. My intention is to put on the boiler to bring on the heating. I put on the kettle. This tells me to get the tea bag and make some tea. I leave the kitchen. I drink my tea. I feel cold. So I get up and put on the heating. This was unpredictable. Because the mind, as I get older, becomes more dispersed, more unruly. We are as we are. No, nothing to complain about. We just live our funny lives. So that's what it means by immeasurable activity. It's unpredictable. Nobody can say it's good or bad or right or wrong. It just, no, oh, this is how I'm living at the moment. The result of this is that the flame of Mahamudra is burning bright. How could me forgetting to put on my heating be the flame of Mahamudra? James, come on, you're forgetting everything. Okay, I forget. Yeah, I do that, I forget. I'm not standing in judgment on my forgetting. I need my glasses. I'm getting a bit deaf. I forget. It's like this. What is there to say? Take away judgment, good, bad, right, wrong. Oh, but if you had seen me when I was young, you can't compare young James and old James. If I have two apples, I can look at them together and think this one is red, this one is green. But young James is only a memory. He doesn't have the same status as old James who forgets. I am as I am. Patterns arise, change, move. This is why it is Mahamudra. Mahamudra is a sahaj, it's a co-emergence of whatever experience there is and the clarity of, uh, usually they say yeshe, of, of, of jnana, of uh, original knowing. I am not a thing. Your thoughts can't catch me. 
my thoughts can't catch me. There is no way to reify the actuality of the unceasing movement of the energy of the mind. So, then he says, the knot of the object dissolves in the vastness of the subject. This is very interesting. If you think of a knot, you take some string and you tie a knot in it and you pull it tight. The knot is a pattern of the string. It's not something other than the string. The knot doesn't change the essence of the string. It just moves around in a particular pattern. No. The field is open and empty. The knots are the momentary grasping, the reification that seems to solidify this is something. This is a thought. A commentarial thought, a judgmental thought. Has the object been tied in a knot? The knotting is done by the concept you have about what has occurred. Something seems to have happened. When you untie the string, it's not knotted. The knot was a shape. Just as I can distort myself, and then not. I'm so stupid, I keep forgetting things. Oh God, I hate getting old, it's so difficult. These are not. Nothing is established. A moment of irritation, which is then gone. The conclusion doesn't catch me because I'm not a thing. So, because the, the subject, the true nature of the subject is a rigpa, unborn awareness, it's vast like the sky, every seemingly knotted form dissolves the way clouds dissolve into the sky. As the depth of awareness unites releasing and immediacy, in this line, the semki long means the space of the mind. In the space of the mind, you have the inseparability of these two aspects of Sokshen practice, Trekcha and Tirga. Trekcha means to, to cut straight through. That's a little bit brutal. That's the kind of the language of, I have to do something. Actually, the mind is self-liberating. The mind cuts itself free because all mental activity is inseparable from its empty ground. So the essence of treasure is to stay relaxed and open and not interfere in whatever is occurring. Then when the long established habits of interfering, of correcting, of improving and so on, as they become less and less, you have more access to the immediacy of the mind. And then you see, oh, experience is the mind. It's just this ungraspable. Oh, the heart is the, the vastness of the mind. As, as, as soon as you are clear that your mind is not a thing, all the difficulties start to resolve by themselves. The creativity of the ground arises within the ground, manifesting as uh, shining rays of light. The creativity of the ground, or uh, jinang, the, the, the ground's appearance, or the ground's light, this is, you know, you go. This is uh, the experience of Turgel. And it is Sheila Shalwa. It is uh, the it is the the, the arising from the ground itself. In the ground is what you awaken to with structure. There are many many complicated ideas you can have around this. Your mind your mind is empty. Nothing comes from nothing. 
something doesn't come from nothing. The something that comes from nothing is nothing. So that's a symbol of light. Light is ungraspable. It's not a thing. Thoughts also you can't catch. You can catch the echo of the thought, the memory of the thought, the shadow of the thought, but the thought itself is uncatchable. So the light of the ground or the play of the ground or the creativity of the ground arises on the ground, in the ground, as the ground. When this is clear, then this uh, self-arising natural light manifests everywhere. The true nature or, uh, of your mind or the essence of your mind, which is emptiness, um, is not an object that you can uh, describe. Its uh, natural quality or its clarity or presence uh, is beyond uh, the, the reach of words. An all-pervading compassion or kindness is self-occurring. So these three, the Ngo, Rangshin, Tukje, these are the, the basis of the ripening of Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya. In simple language, we could say is the mind is empty and it's uh, bright or clear or uh, luminous and it uh, has no limit or fixed shape. Its, uh, its connectivity is uh, already functioning. It doesn't have to be installed. Well, these three together form the naturally occurring lamp. It's the intrinsic light of the mind. It's not something illuminating something else, but it's the realm within which everything is self-luminous. So, in order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the pervading Lord, our most kind Guru Dorji Chang, and to the three jewels, and the three roots, and the three kayas, and all the deities. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. <laughs> Drama Chungwe Maku Kia, Tama Reba Tipe Dombo La Nide Waki Ula Jampe Mechemba, Mumba Malung Ama Londu Tim Kincha Minpa, Selve Rango Tse, Rowe Mare Mumba Sachindu Sachindu Chokju Java Seche Tamche Da Lama Chok. Sum tasum plato la pulo shene chetung odrutso. So now he's talking about uh, the kind of butter lamp you offer. Wonderful in the pot made with the five precious substances. In Tibet, there were many kinds of butter lamps made, very beautiful with gold and silver, different kinds of metals, turquoise, pearl, coral, and so on. Within this swirls the oil of butter coming from the concentrated essence of grasses and grains. So the female yak is out on the pasture, eating the grass, gradually producing milk from which the butter is made. On the thin stick, cotton is wound to make the wick. This is then lit and the flame matching the light of the sun and moon burns bright. All darkness without exception dissolves in the vastness of light. We can hardly imagine a world without electric light. If you are out in a Tibetan nomad hut, no electric light, just little butter lamps and the embers of the fire going down. The darkness of the night is dispelled by the lamp. Everybody is a little bit afraid of the dark. Everyone doing yoga is doing Surya Namaskar, meaning sun, come back, we love you. When the light comes, the dark goes. When you see that everything is empty, 
the darkness of the obscurations of believing in real entities dissolves. So with the butter lamp, the illumination of darkness everywhere, this manifests as shining rays of light which go out and uh, make the darkness bright. In order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions and to the Guru, the Three Jewels, the Three Roots and all the deities. Please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. Then in this next verse, he's talking about electric light bulbs. Zanta salve was a ser. Drove Mare Mumba Sanchendo Sanje Gucheng Gigu Tamche da Lama Chopsun Sasum Tatsola Pulo Shene Chutung Odrutso. So wonderful in the pot of glass free of outer and inner obscurations. Oh, this is a glass electric light bulb. And it swirls the oil arising from the power of fire and water, meaning electricity. Within this is the wick made of glowing material. And then from this comes the shining flame of radiant illumination. All demons, troublemakers and obstructors dissolve in the vastness of light, which is free of fears, worries, terrors and fluctuating emotions. The electric light uh, produces such a brightness that uh, the dark corners where the demons might be or troublemakers vanish. And so we become less uh, uh, hospitable to fears and worries and terrors. What is that? What is that? So this links with the rest of the text because when the mind is clear when you have insight into the absence of her inherent existence. Oh, it's empty. It doesn't exist. But if we don't have clear uh, illumination with our mind, then we have imagining. And we imagine there are good people and bad people. So on the basis of this solidifying imagining, we frighten ourselves. Of course, we don't want pain, we don't want to be attacked, we don't want what we would call bad things to happen. But probably we spend more time worrying about things which haven't happened and which won't happen than actually being under the power of a truly dangerous situation. Unimpeded clarity with, without and within manifests a shining rays of light. It means uh, when they make the light bulb, the, the glass inside is very clean. If the outside is not dusty, then the light is manifesting from the filament straight through and it radiates out. In order to dispel the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, we offer this to the sentient beings, all of whom have the cause of Buddhahood, and to the Guru, the Three Jewels, the Three Roots, and all the deities, please accept and then bestow supreme and general accomplishments. So, all sentient beings have the cause of Buddhahood. It is already present with all sentient beings because this is their inalienable connection with the ever pure ground. The, the Buddha nature is not something hidden inside people. Our Buddha nature is that we are moving always in the Dharma Datu, in this infinite space of light and truth. The fact that we don't directly see this at the moment doesn't change it. So when we see sentient beings, birds or cats or people, 
we should never approach them as an object that can be defined. They are the radiance of the Buddha. Then we have a, a final short verse. The Dhamma Pulvesa Nanki Drukun Sipe Jansu Le Drane Mare Mabadun Verapsashi Nankian Sipe Sanjin Yotone Papa Manmutsu Da Yerme Sho. By the merit of offering these lamps, all beings must be liberated from the ocean of Samsara. <clears throat> oh, now we are dedicating the merit of all these lamps we have been offering. It's saying, offering lamps, when you do it with the right view, with a good intention, is very powerful. The merit of this is something which can make a difference. It can really open the doorway for beings. Then, with the suffering of the darkness of ignorance completely removed, all must quickly gain omniscient perfect Buddhahood and become identical with the noble Buddha Dipamkara. Oh, Dipamkara was the Buddha of our uh, period, who was the reigning Buddha before Shakyamuni. His name means the Buddha who made the butter lamp. Oh, next uh, weekend that we have on this uh, topic, we'll look at his sutra and then the concluding prayers. So, in the world, there are many problems and difficulties. Wars, food shortages, uh, all kinds of cruelty, difficult diseases, climate change impact, and so on. The orientation of our cultures tends to be to identify these issues as specific problems and then try to find an antidote to deal with them. How, however, if we remember this Batalam prayer, all these kinds of suffering and difficulty arise from the darkness of ignorance. This is the fundamental root of all the different kinds of difficulties. Therefore, we need to remove the darkness of our own ignorance. We have to look with our mind, at our mind, look in a gentle way. The mind is, the mind is not something you can catch. How will I see something which cannot be seen? How will I find something which cannot be found? We do this by developing the practice from the Guru Yoga of the White Art. We sit with the arising and passing of thoughts and feelings. If you don't follow, follow after what is arising, you become gradually more aware of the space within which everything is moving. Then we simply relax into that space. Our nature is space. This is space. Space and space meets together, sky to sky. So this is the end of the work we can do today. I will finish it next time. Uh, I'm aware that uh, everybody's timetable is a bit uh, tight. I don't know if we can squeeze in anything else. How my radiotherapy will go, I don't know. We'll have to see. It might be not so bad. It might not go very well. Everything is impermanent and unpredictable. But we had these hours this weekend. This is the profound connection of our heart. These practices and this understanding you can take up and gradually massage into you. So I wish you good fortune on your Dharma experience. We say thank you to the translators and to Pedro, who keeps the computer system going. 
and thank you to you for your attention and your interest. It uh, makes my heart very happy. So, dear friends, uh, we say goodbye. Faces, hello, faces. All the best to you, James. Thank you. All the best. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. 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 B